After months of quarantine, we're all interested in how we can become our best self. The team at Permanent Makeup and Cryo is here to help you get the flawless makeup look every day without the extra effort or time. When it comes to your appearance, you deserve the best care that money can buy. Sound art is a product that is a speaker and it's art. We combine it together and we call it sound art. What makes it so unique that any picture can be your speaker? Sound art gives you the high quality sound without the ugly speaker. This isn't a picture with the speaker, the picture is the speaker. Just imagine your wedding picture uh, uploaded onto a canvas and now it's speaking 10,000 tunes. I mean, it's a very cool concept. What we like so much about it that you can take anything that means something very special to you, upload it on the canvas, have it hanging up in your room, your balcony, wherever you want to put it, and now it's a speaker. I mean, how cool is that? It's, it's, it's something that we have that and no one has. No one has this product. It's just a great gift to give anybody. It's just a neat concept. Around here we say, art never sounded so good. The World Center of Racing doubles as the World Center of iRacing League openers, providing us yet another setting, stage setting contest to open up the 2021 campaign of the LTAC Cup Series, beginning with the Tucson Sound Art 250. Welcome, race fans. I'm Andrew Cardinale IV. Joe Donahue and Trey Patton join me virtually on the mic this evening. Corey Rexford is on social media coverage, and this is Pit Stop TV's live coverage of the LTAC Racing Series. 
Tucson Sound Art 250. We join you for tuning in across our multiple platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. We join you tonight from the virtual Daytona Beach, Florida, for the opening round of the LTAC Cup Series. Joe, it's been a very long time since we've had LTAC on Pit Stop TV. It's been a very long time since Season 1, and Stephen Parrott uh, was crowned the champion. There's been a lot that's gone on in this series. A lot has changed, a lot of new drivers, and it's almost like starting all over again, which... To be fair, is what you're doing with us this evening, covering your first LTAC race. Yeah, so this is my first time coming to town with the LTAC series, obviously. But I have been here at Daytona before with these stock cars. And I think coming to Daytona with these cars is pretty standard. I think whether you're a driver or a commentator or a spectator, you sort of have an expectation of what your night's going to be when you come to Daytona. And so hopefully we follow that um, that way of driving and racing and we'll see some cool stuff tonight. I'm excited to be here. Hey Daytona, like you said, uh, we pretty much know what to expect, but these guys have been here before and the, these guys know how to get around here, so it's going to be a wild night, wild ride tonight, and honestly, I'm just looking forward to it. There's nothing better than opening at Daytona. You never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. Daytona is a true wild card, and you know you look to it now as a playoff track almost, or the playoff setting track uh, in the NASCAR Cup Series because it is so unknown. It fits the bill, I think, as that playoff cutoff race. But when we look towards the beginning of seasons, it usually is the opener. Even if you go over into sports car racing, think about IMSA, think about, uh, Amer of course, I would say uh, Grand Am. Uh, you could even run Amer an American Le Mans race here to open up the season. There's a lot that you could do with Daytona, of course, with its massive facility, the 2.5-mile super speedway, the 3-plus-mile uh, uh, road course that, of course, plays host to the Daytona 24 coming up later this month. Very versatile track, and it, I think it fits then as a season opener. Let's talk about the season opener. Let's talk about uh, the fact that these guys have been here for a few days now. It's not just this afternoon, this evening, these guys are racing here. The LTAC Cup Series opened things up on Friday with qualifying and dual racing. Uh, McGill in the number 21. See, that's a new name, so I couldn't even think of the, uh, the first name there. Uh, Holden McGill. Qualified on pole, will start on pole this evening. Uh, Taylor Butcher Benjamin, he qualified second place, so he locked into a second place starting position. Uh, but it was the number 16 of Fallon that ends up starting, well, winning. Uh, John Fallon starting in third because he won his dual race, the first of two. Uh... My bad, that was actually duel number two. It was Jeremy Berger who won duel number one. I got mixed up with the lines over here that I'm reading from. So Jeremy Berger, he's a returning driver, the number 97, uh, that won heat, well, duel number one. It, I guess it is a heat then. Uh, John Fallon won the second of the two duels. So that sets the front two rows. Uh, Holden McGill, Taylor Butcher Benjamin on the outside of row number one. There's Jeremy Berger on the inside, John Fallon on the outside. We'll go through the rest of the starting grid here in a little while, but we have a ton of drivers to talk about through the evening. And over the course of 100 laps, boy, we got plenty of time to talk about them, Joe. Yeah, 100 laps, 250 miles tonight at Daytona. It's going to be plenty of racing and plenty of time for us to be talking about not only the race on track, but all the guys behind the wheel. And and talk about all of all of that stuff here at the mecca of stock car racing daytona it's a big track like you said andrew it's a big facility it gives a lot of allure off too that we might be able to talk about and speak on behalf of these guys of what it means to race at daytona and especially what it means for them to start their series off with this season opener here Yeah, I feel like racing at Daytona is honestly one of the best tracks to race that, you know, most people, some people don't like racing here just because it's just mayhem. But honestly, you know, being, being at the facility and seeing the facility and racing on it, it's just, it's absolutely incredible because there's really nothing else like it. Sure, Talladega is kind of close to it, but like, there's nothing like Daytona. The atmosphere is absolutely incredible and just, there's no other racing like it at all. Trey, I would have to tend to agree. Now, I, I alluded to the fact that we had a season prior to the LTAC Cup Series. Now, we've had a lot of season and league openers here for the channel at Pit Stop TV, but this is one of the few chances we've had so far to be able to open up 
a renewing league, go into a second season of a league on Pit Stop TV. Steven Parrott, I mentioned him winning the championship. He did so by eight points over Landon Derhold, another returning driver. Also look out for Jeremy Berger, who qual or sorry, finished third in the standings last season, 69 points back of Steven Parrott, the eventual champion. Mario Lapinta, he finished fourth, another two points back of Jeremy Berger. Then Sean Deal, Kyle Green, uh, Christopher Lewis, Nate Brooker, they make up some of the rest of the front runners from last season. I think the only driver that I mentioned that is not returning will be Christopher Lewis. I think everybody else that finished up towards the front, we can count on being back here beginning at Daytona. Now, it's a 29-race season, Joe. It's certainly no slouch when it comes to commitment. We've got a lot of different racetracks that we get to look forward to here in the LTAC Cup Series, and I know a lot of fan favorites as well. Think about Richmond. I mean, that that's next week. That is going to be one that people like. It's it's a short track. Certainly lends itself to some amazing racing. But you look forward a little bit further in the season. We're going to places like Milwaukee that we've not broadcasted at yet here on Pit Stop TV. We're going to places like Gateway. We're going to New Hampshire, which actually is a little bit underused here on the iRacing Sim. We're going to uh, let's see North Wilkesboro. Twin Ring Motegi on the Oval. Think back to NASCAR's trips to Japan uh, when we see that on the schedule. We're taking the Cup cars to Iowa. We have an amazing set of racetracks ahead. And in between all of that, of course, we'll have a lot of uh, standard racetracks for these NASCAR Cup cars. Of course, Daytona this evening. We have Atlanta. We have Sonoma, Michigan, Chicago, Dover, Kansas, Pocono, Texas. The list goes on and on and on. We have a really good slate of racing for this season, 29 races in all. Yeah, one thing that's really great, and I've learned this quickly in my short abbreviated period um, learning the LTAC series, is that 29 races is, is something you don't normally see in a sim racing series. I'm sure a lot of people watching or involved not only with us here at Pit Stop TV, but also with the series itself would know that when you go out and you, you say, I want to run in a league on iRacing, you find a lot of opportunities, but you don't find opportunities that have such a long season and, and that go to so many different racetracks. I think that's just something from experience we all have seen. So for LTAC to come out and say, we're going to run a full season, we're going to run 29 races, we're going to go all over the place, we're going to go to road courses, short tracks, super speedways, you name it, we're there. It's a great opportunity for these drivers not only to race and compete for fun and to compete for wins in this series, but also to grow their skills and, and to grow their experience on the, on the platform. And I think that's really cool. It's really unique. I don't think that's something that we find a lot in sim racing. And hopefully some others would follow suit and take the lead to try to experience this and, and get their drivers more races and more opportunities to go out and compete against each other in different settings that might be able to create different winners you know get some guys who are more experienced on the road courses or the short tracks and whatnot i think that really is a great way to just build a base for your drivers to have a good time and learn some more stuff as the season goes on i agree 100 percent. but going in uh adding on to having such a longer season that allows these drivers to, as you said, have more experience, race on a track maybe they don't have a lot of experience on, maybe see some new winners, see some people that are, are road course ringers or short track racers, but that also leaves the guys that maybe aren't, but are maybe, say, your average racer, um, allows them to maybe be more consistent because the longer the season goes, the more consistent of a season you have to have to be in that championship battle when we get to the playoffs. Absolutely. A diverse schedule means drivers can work on every aspect of their skills. I mentioned we set the grid a couple of days ago, Friday night with qualifying and dual racing. Let's walk down it now, Joe Donahue. On row number one, I mentioned Hold McGill qualifies on pole with a fast time. Then it's Taylor Butcher Benjamin to his outside. You go back to row number two on the inside. We're going to have Jeremy Berger, John Fallon. There are a couple of dual race winners. Go back to the runner-ups from the duels. Well, it's Chris Horn in the 01, Richard Springer in the number six, starting sixth place. The inside of row number four, it brings us Jack Ryan, Andrew Cooty to his outside. Rounding out the top 10, Joe, it's going to be Stephen Parrott, last season's champion, and Joseph Joseph in the number 20. 
Yeah, so we'll look back to 11th starting spot on the inside of row 6 is the number 81 of Mason Thompson and to his outside driving the good old number 3 machine, that's Nate Brooker. Starting in the inside of row number 7 is Landon Durhold in the 24 machine and to his outside in 14th is going to be Robert Mathis. Starting off in 15th place, Grant Peterson driving the number 52 machine tonight and to his outside is going to be Dylan Breton in the 17. You're looking at the lineup for row number nine on the inside, Frank Flores in the 23, and to his outside is going to be Ryder Schruth in the number 58. The 10th row on the field is going to see Mario Lapinta in the number 13, and to his outside, starting in 20th, the number 76 of Kyle Green. Going back to the latter half of the field, starting 21st, we have Lauren McFadden, and to his outside, we have Brett Fisher in starting 22nd. 23rd, we have Mitchell Goosens, and to his outside, we have Sean Huff, Huff, Huffstetler. I'm sorry if I messed that up. Uh, behind him, we have Roy Grande in 25th. To his outside, Logan Hamilton in 26th. 27th, we have Colin Stone. In 28th, we have Sean Deal. Running out our top 30, we have Curtis Martin in 29th. and 30th, we have Robert Pattengale. Starting 31st, it's Wes Wigan and Joshua Abbey. We know those two from the Bluegrass iRacing Series. Go back to row 17. It's going to be Anthony Mosani, Zach Arnold on his outside. 35th, rolling off the grid, James Vining. Stefan Purcell joins him on row 18. Row 19 brings us Kevin Franks and Derek Line. The last four positions going to lead off with Ryan Duke and Derek Roloveld rounding out the top 40. The final couple of spots, it's going to be Roger Shelton, Bradley Waters, and I believe we have a 43rd. No, we don't. Just 42 cars checking into tonight's season opener at Daytona. It's going to be a lot of cars. Bear with us on scoring, uh, timing and scoring on the left side of your screen once we get that ticker up. It is going to be a little bit interesting working through 42 very fast machines here at Daytona, but we look forward to every minute of it. 250 miles lie ahead here in the Tucson Sound Art 250. And if you don't know about Tucson Sound Art just yet, they've been a longtime partner of ours now uh, over the course of most of 2020, and they've really taken care of us. And quite simply, at the very least, you need to go check out TucsonSoundArt.com. But your picture, your music. You find the image you want, and they will custom create a beautiful frame to high quality canvas with a built in Bluetooth speaker. With Sound Art, you get the best of both worlds. Visit TucsonSoundArt.com. For additional information, you can also use promo code PITSTOPTV at checkout to receive 10% off of your purchase today. Out of turn number four, we have 42 hungry racing machines looking to get it done here at Daytona International Speedway. It's been a long time for the LTAC Cup Series, but we're finally ready to do it all again. The green flag will fly. We are racing Holden McGill brings us to the green flag. We already have a check up on the outside line here. We'll check into this really quickly as they all stack up. We keep racing and we are officially off and away. McGill looked like he got a nice start there. The outside line didn't seem to get the run that they needed through the try over that first time to stick it out and stay up front, but that's plenty fine. There's plenty of race left coming out of turn two. They're still in the draft, and I think there's going to be no trouble for all of them that got kind of caught up on that start. You see there from that stack up, you see Taylor Butcher Benjamin, who started second, has slotted himself back into the fifth spot, able to find that spot down on the bottom to get back into line. But now we are single file all the way back. I think the whole field might be single file as we have made it one lap here at Daytona for the 2021 season of LTAC. One lap complete. We get to see who uh, is fast and who's maybe not. Well, then again, it is Daytona. Holden McGill leads. Jeremy Berger, Chris Horn, uh, Jack Ryan, Taylor Butcher Benjamin, your top five. And things very, very calm. You see the single file line down on the bottom side, down on the butter if you're from NASCAR 15. It's been a long time saying that one. But uh, very, very clean, very single file. Everybody, I think, has the same agenda. Of course, they raced a bit yesterday. They got a clue of what they want to do. They're just here to, I think, ride around. They know they've got to get through this 100-lap race. Now, what we haven't mentioned yet is that there are stages to get through. Of course, uh, if you go back to last season with them, uh, we had stages in Season 1 as well. But 
30 laps, 30 laps, and 40 are the distances for our stages this evening, which means these guys don't even have to go through uh, a full tire cycle. We will likely see some pits for uh, fuel here in this first stage and the second as well. We're running 50% fuel capacities as we're running 50% laps, but we're not going to see them come in until about lap, I would say, 17 or so. I think that's going to be around where these guys come in, just a little bit past halfway in this first stage. That's where you can count on these guys to start making their way down the pit lane for some Noko race fuel. Yeah, so that will break up the stage fairly nicely, but I do think that the strategy right now, Trey, would be to try to get as many laps in clean as you can. I know I talked last night when our little broadcast when we were at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. When you get hyped up to start a race and you get ready to go, you're revving, you're coming to the green flag, you get the green flag and then there's a caution. That just kills your, kills your mood, kills your mental state. So I think these guys are all well aware that right now they just want to get a couple good laps in and just get the race rolling. Absolutely. A caution can definitely be a mood killer right at the start, but as Andrew mentioned, these guys have been here since Friday, so this isn't the first race they've ran here this weekend. So they kind of have a general idea of how to run you know, with the people around them and just what to expect, really. You know, early on in a race like this, you know, you can't win it on lap one. You can't win any race on lap one, but you can certainly lose it. So you definitely want to stay pretty, uh, pretty tame, I guess you would say, and just try and work your way through. And then I don't really think we'll see any moves or any aggressive moves, you would think, really until it comes cl close to the end of stage, uh, the, uh, the end of the stages, because those stage points are definitely valuable. Absolutely. We've seen the different stage points can make both in NASCAR and on our leagues here at Pit Stop TV and several others as well. I mean, stage points are very, very important. It pays consistency throughout the course of an entire race. And over the course of 250 miles, it's super, super important rather. Taylor Butcher Benjamin starting to lead a charge on the outside line, bringing the 6 of Springer and the 24 of Landon Derhold with him. So uh, already a top side charge after that very messy start for the top line. It's going to give possibly that lead of the number one car it does at the line taylor butcher benjamin now a lap leader over holden mcgill the first lap not to go to the 21 car yeah and i'm really surprised i'm really glad to see butcher benjamin pushing on the outside getting those cars back up there because like we said he started up at the front and then had the little bobble start that or at least got pulled back from the bobble at that start that put him in fifth place in that first lap and he ran a couple laps there just to get through some time but as you see, he led a charge on the top side, and right now that number one car is gunning for the race lead, giving us a nice little battle to watch here as they continue to count the laps down towards this, the end of this first stage. There's plenty of race left, Trey, in it, but I think it's really nice that we have something exciting going on here that we get to keep talking about. Absolutely. You know, even when single, even single file racing here at Daytona or even Talladega, it can be kind of interesting you know, even if it is single file, because you you still don't know what's going to happen. You know, one small bump and bobble from somebody could easily just wreck the entire field. But these guys seem to have themselves sorted out, as Andrew mentioned last time that, or last time by rather, that the outside line we see now has started to make a move as Taylor Butcher Benjamin is on the point on that outside line. He might be able to clear them. Nope, they're still side by side, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's able to clear that inside line that we see him jump to the bottom. Yeah, I think that's kind of the dance you end up with in these races where the top sign gets going and then the leader then drops down in front of the bottom side and, and it takes that race lead over because then they're going to get two three maybe even four laps sometimes just leading the race on the bottom side a bit of calmness in the storm before that top side reorganizes then you play pied piper possibly or just let it all happen let the cycle happen and uh, fall into second place but we we say that and the top line kind of falls back they do get a run down this back stretch and this is the cycle you see uh if it's not a cycle of changing the guard at the front it's a cycle of the top side coming and going where they'll get this charge up to the front they get about even maybe even nose ahead where we saw taylor lead a couple of laps and they just fall back for a little bit and they have to get that head of steam going again you see that top side forming up gaining strength over the course of these laps still very very early not even a third of the way in into this first stage but already side by side by side by side by side and finally looks like Holden McGill gonna step ahead of 
the one car for just a moment. Then you see that one gets the momentum on the outside once more and will draw back even, even ahead of Holden McGill down the back stretch. Yeah, the momentum that you get running off the top side, coming down that banking, that's what Butcher Benjamin has been using to his advantage to get his nose ahead of McGill out of the corners. Whereas when you run through the corners themselves, being on the inside gives you a slightly shorter path, which means you're going to get there quicker if you're running the same speed. So when you come out of the corners, you'd expect Butcher Benjamin to lead that top line with a little bit of steam and possibly make a pass coming into the next set of turns, but the corners are where McGill's got the advantage, and then obviously we get a nice little race to the tri-oval when we cross the stripe each time. We're already 10 laps into this race. Everybody's been racing really clean. We do have very cleanly organized and set top and bottom lines right now, not too much jumping between, which is giving us a really great race with these cars all given a nice draft to each other and racing side by side down the straights and through the corners. Side by side racing, indeed. I was actually just about to mention that I was actually pretty shocked that I hadn't really seen anybody drop out of the pack uh, on the back stretch, you know, because sometimes, you know, being in a pack like this, you know, having 42 cars on track, that's a lot of cars. You know, you don't really see a full field of cars really on iRacing, especially uh, in a stock car league. But uh, as we saw there, we did see a few cars down on the apron. I don't know if that was them backing out of the pack or maybe they got forced down, but. As you see on timing and scoring, it looked like all the way back to about 30th is still in this pack on the lead lap. So, I mean, we still have a fairly decent sized pack here on lap tw uh, 11 coming to lap 12. Coming around to put 11 laps in the books. Now a little way is past a third of the way in this first stage. And, and the stage racing is going to provide a whole lot of opportunities for drivers who might not always end up in the front at the end of the race. Uh, a chance to earn some extra points. We've seen that over in a few other series we cover. A whole lot of opportunities uh, for drivers that, again, need those points to change their season, honestly. Uh, to get up there and get a few points just by playing strategy. And they have two chances to do it as well here in the LTAC Cup Series. So certainly opening up opportunities. That begins with stage number one at Daytona. Holden McGill still leading the way. Taylor Butcher Benjamin wants to change that, though. But the Napa number one just cannot go anywhere on that top side. You see... Jeremy Berger really can't do anything for Holden McGill. This is what you get locked into sometimes where neither line can really get more than a car length ahead before they get sucked back to it. And that's the result of the side draft here at Daytona. You're able to get down there and put more air on the spoiler of the car you're trying to race. And it really ends up changing the way this race goes. A little bit of blinking out of there, uh, out of the 21 car, but everything holds steady. And you see a whole lot of new colors through this field as well. A whole lot of new paint schemes for these guys. It's going to be hard to get used to them all. Yeah, it's always a tough thing for us up in the booth to try to reverse ourselves to the drivers by name when they get these new paint schemes but we love to see it we love the color schemes of all these cars and it's really awesome to see the variety throughout the field you're on board with the 69 car steven perio on the inside line and you see somebody cut down to the bottom oh because that's because we got a yellow we got a yellow right here on lap 13. And we're going to see if we can take a look back and find this. I'm not sure that we're actually going to have a replay, but we will certainly check. And, of course, I mentioned with 42 cars, it's going to be tough to see if we do have some of these replays that are way further back in the pack. But we'll take a look back here and see what we've got. You know, I'm not seeing anything that we have. And that may just be the way that it goes sometimes, especially opening things up at Daytona. There's those couple of packs that form. You have everybody that's up in the front, then you have a few that fall back. And No, here it is, actually. Oh, it's going to start. Is that Robert Pattengale? It sh oh, it surely is. The 13 car, or sorry, 33 car heavily involved in this. And that's not what you want to see out of the Tucson Sound Art machine. Yeah, that's a tough break. We're going to try to get a replay full extent of why we pulled this yellow out on lap 13 you're going to see it on your screen they're going to come through the corner side by side as they were nothing estranged about it they're running down the back stretch here on your screen right now you're watching the 33 car on the outside 
they're just running down the back stretch. Nothing quite yet. As we go into turn number three, just all on his own, a little bit loose when the banking comes into play and just collects everybody else behind him. Yeah, that's unfortunate to see as, uh, you know, definitely hitting those transitions can definitely uh, make your car a little upset. I don't, I don't know if that's what happened there, or maybe he may have had a hardware issue, but you definitely see him go basically from the wall down to the middle of the track and uh, hit that 55 machine. We're going to get another look at that. So looking at Robert Pattengill, yeah, I'm not quite sure what happened there. And then the 55 goes up, collects the 57 and the 88. Looks like the three drove straight through that. And just unfortunately, about three or four more cars get caught up in that. You know, that's just part of racing at Daytona. You got to expect the unexpected. And these guys are going about 200 miles an hour. So you don't have a lot of time to react. No, you certainly don't. I, I will say this is definitely just Pat and Gill gets a little bit loose. And it's easy to do sometimes if you chuck the car into the corner a little bit. If you're a little bit... Uh, aggressive with how you turn into turn three uh, it can certainly catch you a little bit off guard and the back end of the car comes around it's exactly what happens we'll watch it again here and then we'll hit up some slow-mo because yeah you see the 33 got loose came down the racetrack wigand i mean there's nothing he can do he's along for the ride at that point thankfully his dirt track junkies teammate joshua abby just skates by nate brooker not so lucky you see a lot of more cars piling in uh, kyle green there in the 76 car barely gets by i'm gonna watch that back from his point of view in a moment definitely a, a big one to start the day yeah and you, know, you can't blame Pat and Gil for that. like you said you come into this corner at over 200 miles an hour and you got to think about the momentum that that car is holding it's going to be a tough transition when you get on that banking I mean we, we talk about Daytona all the time one of the most banked racetracks these cars will ever go to as you're on board with Kyle Green to get this awesome view of this incident but it's just a hard thing to do is to control this car with with the tires that are so small relative to the size and weight of a stock car as you see Kyle Green obviously has an awesome wreck avoidance to keep his car clean and he can continue on it's just tough to control that much inertia of what you have with a stock car when you get onto the bank again all the weight just goes all will willy wonka cattywampus on you in the middle of the corner Watching that on board, you know, I know a lot of people reference Days of Thunder a lot when trying to drive through a wreck, but like really going at that, uh, at that rate of speed, as you said, a lot of inertia and everything, just trying to avoid all that at the level that he did it was absolutely incredible. Being able to avoid that, just I know I said Days of Thunder, that's just what came to my mind, you know, just drive through it, and that is exactly what he did. Well, how about that? We check out the replays under caution, and we come back, and already, pace car lights out. We're ready to restart. Most of, no, actually, the entire field, it looks like, all came down pit lane. Holden McGill, he came in. It looks like they all came in for very short stops as well. I'm seeing about seven seconds apiece, which means that's likely just fuel to try and get to the end of stage number one. We'll watch this restart here from about the flag stand in the tri-oval pace car. Going to duck back into pit lane, and we're going to do it all over again. The green flag will fly. They'll get these engines roaring back to life, and we are green flag back to racing action and we are more than halfway through this first stage so we should be good to go to the end of it which would be nice we get some good racing here mcgill on the bottom side getting a little help from the number 97 car burger's gonna push those two up ahead we got the 29 oh they're big time wrecking in turns one and two that is about half the field that is definitely not what you want to see. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Joe, a caution right away and trying to restart, it completely throws your mojo off. And I don't think these guys were prepared for that. We're going to get another look at that for you here. We mentioned the fast repair earlier on. They're going to need it. Con no, Chris Horn just gets uh, Taylor Butcher Benjamin sideways in turn two. And, I mean, there's nowhere to go. Everybody's trying to restart. 
Uh, nobody's expecting to have to lift all of a sudden, and I mean, it, that is just quintessential bumper hook. That is what you always have to try to avoid here in iRacing if you're coming to a plate track, but it's so, so hard to do so. We'll watch it here from the O1's perspective. This is actually on board with Taylor Butcher Benjamin. Yo, let's watch what he sees first, because he's just riding along, and suddenly he's going to be turned sideways with nothing that he can do. Once you get hooked like that, you absolutely cannot do anything. This is from the top of the car, just looking forward. Suddenly that car is sideways, he ends up getting turned a bit more because he obviously he's got to jump out of the throttle now. And if the 01 doesn't jump out of the throttle perfectly in time, well, that's exactly what happens. That trailing car ends up all over the back end of the car that he's already gotten loose and it just makes a bad problem a whole lot worse. Let's check it out now from the perspective of Chris Horn. Yeah, I'll tell you, Andrew, when you go through these restarts and you talk about not hooking cars, not getting too much on their bumpers, uh, the restarts are kind of a, a problem spot as you're looking at Chris Horn from behind. He just was trying to work with the one car, trying to draft with him, give him a little tap on the bumper to get his speed up so they could get up to full speed and compete for the race lead. And it's just a problem spot when they're coming up to speed. It seems like that is when the bumper touching goes on and... As, as they always say in Racing Tray, one of the big things about it is cautions breed cautions, and I think that's a big part of it, is the momentum and the speed they're trying to get up. Cautions breed cautions. You see right there, Chris Horn was trying to give Taylor Butcher Benjamin a bump there, but you see Taylor went up the track a little bit, so whenever he went to bump him, it was not a square hit. So he hit him, you know, more so on the left end or left side of that bumper, which is what made him go sideways. And when he got off the gas, Chris was still in the gas, which is ultimately ultimately what caused that incident. Obviously, no malicious intent behind Chris Horn, but unfortunately, you know, that's just what happened, and that's why we are under caution again. Let's check it out one more time here, and we'll actually go back just a little bit more. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is just one of those things that happens when you're plate racing. You get to somebody, you're trying to help them out. We've said it a couple of times now already. Uh, and you just barely get off center. You can see it's very hard to stay in line. Yep, Butcher just went up just a slight bit. And Taylor's really good at these plate tracks too. I, I, I'm not really sure what happened with the car. Maybe it was when he reached over to shift. I don't know but just goes slightly up the racetrack. It might have even been from a maybe a little bit of contact. Of course, net code happens front and back, just like it happens side to side sometimes. Maybe something happened there. Just for whatever reason, the one car goes up the tiniest, tiniest bit, and Chris Horn gets into those left rear, and the cars are so sensitive these days, it just goes right around. I mean, I, I honestly think even if you go back 40 years if you're running cars at these speeds you're still going to have a car get very very unsettled like that and uh, if you make contact on the right rear or left rear quarter panel rather that's exactly what's going to happen all of this said the one car is fixed back up and uh, is able to use his fast repair he'll get back onto the racetrack and continue on with us we already have this caution flag again out of the way pace car lights are out we're restarting this time by holden mcgill holds the race lead Jeremy Berger, second place, and it's Michael Goosens, Ryan Duke, Logan Hamilton, top five. Yeah, so they're coming back to the green. You can see on your screen the rest of the lineup as they will return to the starter stand and get the green flag next time by. We're a fifth of the way into this race already, 20 of 100 laps down, 10 laps to go in stage one, Trey, and I'm looking forward to seeing if these guys can get green and get these laps uh, counted out these last 10 for the stage. We should have a pretty good race to the line and getting those stage points out. Yeah, the race to the race to the end of the stage one will definitely be one to watch, you know, considering the fact that now these guys, I think they only have one fast repair. So this might actually change how these guys are going to evaluate their strategy. You know, they were banking on maybe having that fast repair for later on in the race. And now that probably I think half the field has already used it. So these guys don't want to be overly aggressive this early on in the race just to get taken out and not be there at the end. So I think it's going to be definitely one to watch, but I still think the end of the stage will be slightly aggressive, but not something overly aggressive to where the field will be wrecked. 
Well, since we've already had a lot go on in this opening stage, guys, let's take a seat back. Let's watch what happens on the end car for one of these restarts for a moment. Let's watch on board with Logan Hamilton as he comes up through the gears. We do have the green flag back out. It's lap number 20. Let's just watch and listen to the onboard here for just a moment. see a whole lot of moving around and honestly guys I think it's harder to keep a car in a straight line at 90 miles an hour than it is at 190 for some reason when you're coming up through the gears and the car isn't totally loaded into the racetrack it just seems to move around a whole lot more that's why there's so much moving around on these restarts but when you get up to 200 miles an hour I, I guess everything just goes by so much more quickly and, and for some reason it seems like it's easier to keep the car where you need it to be yeah, it is kind of perturbing. It is obviously aerodynamics when you get up to speed that start putting downforce on the car, let you have a little bit more stable run down the straightaways and through the corners. But I've always been very uh, interested in the way that stock cars run in lower speeds when they do this thing that you're talking about, when they start accelerating back up to speed. I mean, we've all felt it driving these cars on the program. It's just when you get up to speed, you're a little loose. You're a little uh, unsteady, and uh, it's just the way that the weight distribution is going to the back of the car that starts making it kind of handle a little differently. But obviously, like you said, once we get up to full speed, like Sean Huffstetter, Holden McGill have done right now, you're on board looking out the tail of your current race leader. It just seems like when you get up to speed, the car is set into the way they want to run, and that's how they are able to run so smoothly when you get back up to 200 plus miles an hour. I have said it better myself. Weight distribution in these cars uh, are definitely a factor when getting up to speed there. Uh, another reason you'll see some of these guys going out of line is that, you know, especially running in a pack like this at Daytona Talladega, you have to watch those temps. That's why you don't really see a lot of these guys on the bumper. You see them pretty close, like right here on Holden McGill's onboard. Looking back at the 29 of Mitchell Goosens, you see him close, but he's not on the bumper. That right there, it's creating a little bit of an air bubble. There's a better view of it. So you see, he's pretty close. I mean, I could probably walk maybe in between those two cars. But like, that right there creates a little bit of an air gap. See, you're gonna see him go up the track a little bit to try to get some clean air on the nose of that machine to cool down his engine. Because you don't wanna overheat. Because if you overheat, then you gotta drop out of line and you might not be able to drop out of line. And if you blow up, that's disaster for everyone behind you. Yeah, you said that, Trey, about the temperature of the car. If you overheat your engine, you also have to think about the optimal operating temperature of the car. And if you overheat it, obviously it's not going to be running at 100%, and then you're going to be losing time because your engine isn't going to be running at the right spot. And you can obviously damage your car by doing this too. So it's not even just a short-term getting the optimal speed of the car and the power out of the engine, but it's the long term of not screwing up your entire race by taking your engine and, and giving it a hindrance by overheating and then not being able to operate at the proper temperature. Absolutely. You see, these guys are doing a very good job of, you know, keeping a gap and still, I say, I guess you could say distancing themselves, but still staying close enough to where they can have a competitive race as we see now them coming across the stripe for lap 26 four laps to go in stage one definitely one in the books here hey uh holden mcgill still on the point and we have a caution caution flag gonna hold our progress once more this time lap 26 of 200 and i don't see any slow cars in our uh, timing and scoring. This one we finally may not have the replay for. Uh, told you it's been an issue, and, and talking about it in the chat a little bit uh, with some drivers. Um, let's see, we'll try and check in. We're, we're talking about it with some people in the chat. There we go. Uh, that it isn't set to draw all cars. I can assure you we are set to draw all cars. It's a, an issue with iRacing, whatever that may be. 
But uh, for some reason, yeah, you can see the caution lights come on on the emergency vehicles there. We don't have an incident, but we're told that it involves the number 69 car of Stephen Parrott, which is very unfortunate, actually. Last season's champion in troubles here in stage number one. Yeah, and we're coming right to the close of the stage. I mean, it's a 30-lap stage, and now we're going to... So we do have a replay here, but we're going to get to the end of this stage now without the 69 car in contention like this. You bring the replay up on your screen. Oh, my apologies, Andy. So we're not going to get the replay up on the screen, even though you saw the, uh, the thing come up that said replay. So we've got three laps until the stage ends. McGill's leading, but obviously the 69 car taken out of contention from that one. A tough break for the uh, driver of that car, because obviously these points are crucial as the season progresses all season long. These small amounts of points you can get incrementally through these stages are going to add up over the course of 29 races. Absolutely. That's why consistency is key. You definitely want to stay consistent as long as you can. You know, it's still early on in the race, but as we said, uh, stage points are very, very, very valuable. And that's why these guys are trying to be up front on the point. And, you know, it's not even being up here during the stage. You know, these guys want to be up front the entire time. But at least knowing that you can be up front during the stage, get some points, and then maybe lack for, or I guess, if you don't want to be up front in the chaos before the end of a stage, you can drop back a little bit, kind of relax, try to get your, get your mojo back, try to figure out a strategy on what you're going to do. And then when it comes to the end of the next stage, try to get up there and get some more points. And then obviously after stage two, you're going to try and get up there and get that win. So now eyes turn to the possibility of this stage being over before we go back green flag racing. I'm checking out the rule book here, guys. It looks like we may finish this one under green flag. Um, based on the LTAC rulebook, uh, section 4.6, if a caution comes out after pit road is closed but prior to the regular stage end, this stage will be called early. The way I understand that is since it is before pit road had closed, it would be closing this time by at two to go, we will re-rack them and re-snack them and try this one again. It looks like we might even go green flag racing possibly on lap 30 for just one lap, a one lap shootout would certainly be interesting to end a stage Daytona of all places. Uh, man, I, I look forward to seeing how this shakes out. Now, if we do not run one more green flag lap for stage number one, Holden McGill is your stage winner, Jeremy Berger second place, then it's Mitchell Goosen's Grant Peterson. How about him at the fourth place? Uh, Logan Hamilton. Uh, Mario Lapinta in sixth. Ryan Duke. Joseph Joseph. Uh, Sean Hustutler and Zach Arnold, your top 10, and therefore the points paying positions. We will, of course, see what exactly transpires, but based on the rule, I would expect at least some form of restart before we complete stage number one. Now, we'll see if pace car lights do go off here. If they do extinguish, of course, we know we're going back, going back green flag racing, and we are. So this is the one to green lap. That means we have a one lap shootout. So this is going to be really interesting to see who gets those points. I think the two big points are get a good restart. You don't want to lose your chance of competing with the other drivers to make spots up, get into points paying positions and get towards the front. But at the same time, even the guys back in rows four and five have a chance to, to win the stage. You just get the right people together, work with each other, and use the draft to carry yourself to the front. I think that's the two big things I'm looking for is get a good restart and work with your buddies to try to move up through this group because plenty of guys further back into the further four, five, six rows could still win this stage. You, you talk about lining up with your buddies. You see Holden McGill has elected to choose the outside line. That is because Grant Peterson in that 52 is his teammate. So you want to talk about lining up with your buddies. So that right there just lines up perfectly with what you're going to say. So we are most likely going to see these two work together to try and get that stage one. But I'm curious to see who of the two is going to try and go for it. So we get a chance to see exactly how those teammates are going to do versus the couple of guys out on the bottom side. Again, those being Jeremy Berger and Mitchell Goosens. 
You also see some extra guys around here. We've got Logan Hamilton. We've got Joseph Joseph, Ryan Duke, and more completing the top 10. Lap 29 of 100. Coming to lap 30 of 100. To wrap up stage number one, we go green flag racing. Holden McGill, the race leader, through the tri-oval. Grant Peterson already clear of third place with him. How about this from these two? They've already got one and two. But... That run up from Jeremy Berger and Mitchell Goosens will be massive. Yeah, what McGill did right there was he took out of the equation what Berger could have used to propel himself to the race lead right there was to get a good restart. And McGill wanted to be better on the line and get that restart that put him out in front. He took the number 52 car with him. They're already going into turn three and they're single file, but there's still plenty of track left to get the pass done. You see a big pile up in the back corner. Mitchell or er, Grant Peterson around, still wrecking. Big accident to round out stage number one. We ride with now our stage winner, then Holden McGill to the start finish line. Stage one is official, and what a mess we've got in turns three and four. It begins with Grant Peterson, who was up behind his teammate. And let's take a look back at what happens here in turns three and four. Heartbreak for sure for Grant Peterson and many, many others. Jeremy Berger was all over his back end. You see the first big hit. That was the 94 into the wall, but we stay with it. And, I mean, Jeremy just never lifted and just jacked his back end up off the ground. I get it. You're going for the stage points. But that's exactly what happens right there. Yeah, it's kind of the same term of events that happened with our where you're coming back up to speed. Obviously, you're in three and four rather than turns one and two, but you're coming up to speed and you're just nose to tail. You're coming to the end of the stage. You don't want to lift. You want to keep as much momentum with your car as possible, and that's just what bites him this time around. Obviously, this happened twice on the track, so you're watching Sean Huffstetter's uh, incident here as they come down the back stretch. He's got a good run down the inside, and then I didn't see quite if he moved up a little bit or if it came down, but just running out of the... A real estate on the track to make moves and get past other cars to get those points to the stage. So we'll take a look back into some more of the replay here, and this is following uh, Huffstutler. And you're going to see Mario Lapinta is going backwards on this restart. We'll actually we'll take a look at this from the onboard of the 17 if we can, right quick. And. Uh, Mario, I mean, quite simply, just turns left right there. I think trying to go possibly with Dylan Breton, but there was no room to do so. I mean, just turned straight into the door of, uh, of the 94 car. Then you see everything happen up ahead, and Dylan's trying to get on the binders, gets onto the bottom side, rightly so, and then gets turned around. A lot just transpired here to end stage one. Let's take a look back at some more of it. Yeah, it looks like it's just everybody trying to gun it to the line, trying to make those last second passes. And you you can't blame the guys for trying to run real estate like Dylan Breton was doing, trying to run real estate that's going to get you the speed to make the passes. Obviously, you get in a zone here where you're not quite past the driver, but you still want to be where he is, and, and you're not focused on that. You're kind of tunnel visioned up forward in front of you to try to see who's your next uh, opponent, who's your next victim maybe to get past and and when you do that you kind of zone out of what's going on beside you and behind you uh, that kind of thing plays into this incident as well as just everybody's gunning for it everybody wants to get to that line first and nobody's going to let up because those points are important it's where the really the term uh you know selfish racing you know when it comes to Talladega and Daytona, you know, obviously you have to work together with people, but when it comes to stuff like this, or even coming to the final lap, it's not about who you're working with. Obviously you want somebody to work with you or you want to work with someone to put you in that spot. But once you're in that spot, it's all about you. You're trying to get that. And these guys weren't worried about trying to help somebody. They were trying to help themselves get up there. Like you said, uh, not really worried about what was in front of him or who was around him, just kind of zoned out, focused on the, the task at hand. And unfortunately, the downfall of that is obviously a wreck. 
Well, of course, we talked about the end of Stage 1 right there. Let's talk about the Stage 1 results, at least in the top 10. Holden McGill is going to walk away with the Stage 1 win. Jeremy Berger then second place. Logan Hamilton takes third, then it's Zach Arnold, Joseph Joseph, Mitchell Goosens, Kevin Franks, Kyle Green, and Mason Thompson, and Ryan Duke sneaks into that top 10 after starting 39th. Kevin Franks are right in front of him as well in 37th, so a couple of guys from very far back on this grid, Joe, making their way up into the top 10, getting some stage points. It's oh so important. They already have a leg up on the rest of the field. In fact, in ascending order from 10th on up, and they now have a, a even bigger gap back to the position behind them than they would have if they had finished 11th place or worse. It's just that little bit of a leg up. So if something goes wrong the rest of the race now, it doesn't feel quite as bad. It's not quite as big of a blow. They might not leave tonight last place in points. It's oh so important. You hear the caution flag has been extended. You know what, Joe? That means we're going to go ahead and try and grab our stage one winner right quick. Uh, give us just one moment to try and lie and hold him McGill up, but we will try and grab him and talk to him after winning stage number one. Looks like we will be able to grab him and bring him in. Yeah, so we're going to pull Holden McGill in here quickly as they extend this caution, and we should be able to ask him on a few words. Holden, we got you in the booth here with Pit Stop TV. Congratulations on winning the first stage of the season, and it looked like you had some pressure behind you coming to the line, but it went away, and you got that one fairly easily coming to the checkered. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. I was trying to help a teammate get a little better finish in the stage, but didn't quite work out as well for him. But, yeah, it was a good time and went pretty well. Yeah, it looked like your teammate got a little bit of a tap from behind. Obviously, everybody's just racing so hard to get to that finish and get those extra points, it seems like. But you guys, now you're sitting at the front. You're a little bit separated, the two of you. But what's your strategy through stage two to try to get to the end and then be in good position for the finish itself? Uh, just try to keep track position, stay out of the wrecks that I keep seeing in the mirror, and just hope to have a little bit of luck. Awesome stuff, Holden. Well, good luck. Congratulations on winning the stage. We'll let you go because you're coming back to the green. Good luck, and maybe we'll be talking to you again before the night's over. Thanks, man. Have a good one. And there you have your stage one winner, Trey Patton. You see, not a man of many words, but he's very focused right now. You can't blame him for that because he's sitting in that car getting ready to go green on stage two. Yes, laser focus coming from that 21 machine. Every right, uh, rightfully so, you know, coming off of the stage victory, you know, being up front with some of the same guys that were behind him. Jeremy Berger lining up alongside him. He's been you know behind him most of the race being a pusher so we're gonna see what happens coming back to the green flag you see it's lap 34 on the far side of stage number one's completion hold him gill p1 jeremy berger p2 on the outside he's hanging on to that right rear of the 21 car that is going to close that window behind mcgill it's going to force him to fall a little bit further back or get a top line going what will joseph joseph do as goosens is he going to let berger in on the bottom side it looks like he's trailing the break a little bit that's going to back everybody up they start to stack up as the draft comes back into play a little side by side almost three wide further back in the top 10 Everybody vying for positions early on in stage number two. Again, a 30-lap distance. Yeah, you saw everybody kind of deciding whether they wanted to stick their nose up to the top side and form up the top line or if they wanted to stay on the bottom down the back stretch that first time, see whether or not they get a better run on the inside or the outside. We actually have three wide racing going on for the second spot right now, the number 97, 10, and 96. We're going side by side by side. That sorts itself out at the same time and I'm getting word also that the number 97 car is getting sent to a drive through penalty in the pit lane for changing lanes before the start finish line is what I am being told through our chat so unfortunate but a small setback in the long term effect of still having over 60 laps to go you see he was able to get down to the bottom side very safely so that's fortunate for him and the rest of the field you're going to see him go down should be right here out of turn four we're on board with jeremy berger as he goes down the bottom 
into pit lane to serve that drive through penalty. Unfortunate for him, but the good thing about it is that he's got about 60 more laps to make all that time back up. Checking in to the back end of the top 10 right now. Remember Taylor Butcher Benjamin? Oh, he got wrecked a little while ago. Well, he is back up into the front just about. He is in now seventh place behind Ryan Duke. It's all single file ahead of him, so he might have to do some riding around, but how about the number one car? In fact, Wes Wigan there as well. We talk about Wes every so often there in the Bluegrass iRacing series. Not much help right now, but stays in this race with that one faster pair. Yeah, that fast repair is going to be helping a lot of these drivers throughout this race that get caught up in unfortunate incidents early on in the going, or maybe they want to save it for the end. But I was going to mention that before you did, Andrew, even that for those of you who might follow the Bluegrass iRacing series, myself included, being, especially for me, new to the LTAC series, it's very refreshing to see the West Wagon car. This be the same scheme that you're used to seeing in that series with the same driver. It's very helpful to the eyes for us to see West Wigan with this car but you see this car has a lot of momentum right now he caught all the way back up to the number 10 machine might give him a little bit of love down the back stretch he might want to work with him try to move those two towards the front Wigan and Zach Arnold working that top side you got a little bit of help coming behind him you got uh let's see you got Chris Horn behind him and the nine machine of that is Andrew Cootie behind them. They got that top line starting to square away. They're going to go up there. Looks like the two machine of Jack Ryan has jumped to the top side. So he's going to pilot that outside line and try and surge to the front. Boy, Trey, you and I have been learning a lot of new names this week. These ones are just taking a minute to stick. Holden McGill still leads. We've got wrecking in the back. We'll try and check into some of that as, uh, oh man, there were a lot of cars spreading out a lot of different directions. It looks like we're going to stay green flag. We'll keep up with the race leaders then as it's lap 39 of 100. We stay green flag racing. We have a newcomer to the front of the field though as, oh my, we have that lapped car on the outside. He'll get up and out of the way. Is that possibly, no, it's not Ryan Pattengale, but it is another Lapped car looks like it might have been Ryder Shroud from the 58. Side by side, here comes the number two, Jack Ryan. He's going to take the race lead. He does that cycle we talked about a little while ago towards the top of the show where he drops down in front of the race leader on the bottom side. The AOD Racing number two blocks his teammate. His teammate goes up outside three wide. It's lap 40, guys. There's plenty of race left in this one, but they're still going three wide for that race lead. You saw the number two machine of Jack Ryan. What he did was he was on the inside line earlier on, and then he jumped out when he saw the 10 car coming along on the outside. Those two are teammates, so those buddies working together on the outside of Joseph. Joseph, right now, you're seeing the uh, two car of Jack Ryan jump in behind him. McGill's still leading the way, but Jack Ryan showed his nose, and I think that's really crucial to show the rest of this race and the rest of these drivers that you can very easily put together something on the outside and make some competition coming to the line. That might be something we see come back around at the end of the stage and maybe even at the end of the race, too. I think one of the biggest losers out of that scenario, you saw a car down on the apron, lost a lot of ground. That was Mitchell Goosens. He dropped out of that, was like, heck no, I'm not getting involved in that at all. Good decision, but unfortunately for him, you know, they kept it going, kept it green. So now he's dropped back out of the top 10, back to about 15th. And I can't blame him one bit. After seeing that three wide, there goes another lapped car as they go by him. That was insane what we just saw. Again, those were teammates that did not play nice at all. So how about that? I That was not... I thought they were going to try and get both of them clear of the race leader of Holden McGill. Uh, color me all kinds of surprise. Usually you say tickle me pink. Tickle me surprised as uh, the pink number two got no help from the 10 of Zach Taylor. Oh my, sorry, Zach Arnold is, wow, he got one car on the apron. It's the nine. Andrew Cootie gets back onto the racing surface. Boy, these guys have been racing like it's lap 100 for about 15, 20 laps now. We've still got over half the race to go. How about this for action in the Tucson Sound Art 250? Yeah, this is really impressive to see right now, especially considering we're not even halfway through this stage yet, and these guys are still racing each other as hard as they are. They want to get towards the front, maybe, and obviously they want to put some air on their nose to keep their cars at a proper op operating temperature, but it's crazy to see these guys racing so hard 
three wide down the backstretch. We saw that a couple times out of everybody as now they've decided that that is not the way to go. They don't want to risk the biscuit and get into an accident here on lap 43. So we see predominantly single file racing. A couple of guys getting a little squirrely down the backstretch and into the corner as well. A couple of them go up to the high side temporarily into turn number three, but out of turn four, they're still all predominantly single file at the front with a little bit of slew going on in the back. Yeah, you want to talk about these guys getting a little squirrely down the back stretch into the corners. I'm seeing some of these guys, you know, you want to paint that yellow line. You know, as long as you're on that yellow line, it's really hard to get around anybody that's on that line. Because as you mentioned earlier, Joe, that is the shortest way around the track. But these guys are getting uh, pretty brave with that. So they're actually dipping down onto the apron a little bit. You, you'll hear me mention it on some other broadcasts. You don't want to touch that apron, especially at a place like Daytona or Talladega. The banking here is so, so high, and you're going at a high rate of speed. You don't want to do that. You, I mean, that's just going to create a massive wreck. We're coming up on two lap cars here. They're going to get by them absolutely no problem. A little three-wide action there. They get by them there. We're on board. We lost Ray Patton there for a moment, but it's 31 degrees of banking here at Daytona to add to his point. So if you get down onto that flat, which is zero or one degrees of banking, it's going to really upset the race car, and you're going to have some problems. That's why you don't want to touch it. In real life, you see the left sides of the splitters scrape against that apron and cause all kinds of showers of sparks. Unfortunately, not quite the same here, but boy, you sure do get sparks in the wrecks that happen as a result of it. It's lap 45. Not side-by-side side quite for the race lead, but certainly as for fourth place as Ryan Duke holds on to the bottom side of Wes Wigan. Oh my, they get right next to one another and almost door bang a little bit out of turn number two. You see most of the top ten here. Let's focus a little further back in this field now, Joe. We talked a lot about the guys at the front. Let's talk about some guys just outside the top ten, beginning with Mitchell Goosens here in the 29. Taylor Butcher Benjamin there as well. How about last season's champion, Stephen Parrott as well? Yeah, so like we saw with the one car and the 29, obviously Butcher Benjamin led a lap earlier on in the race in Perro. The 69 car is the reigning champion of the series. These guys are just running back here conservatively, trying to knock the laps down and to get closer to the stage or to at least a fuel stop before they start really putting the binders on and putting on the afterburners to get up there and get those points expecting a caution isn't something we always say is necessarily a great thing but it is what happens in these races because you get all these guys so close together and we've seen it already in the last couple laps once you start getting three wide once you start racing hard cautions can happen and so these guys right now are just being a little conservative trying to run a couple laps in a safer position running single file only in a small group and either they'll get a caution or they'll just run out these laps and be competitive further into the race over at timing and scoring these guys have run about 15 to 17 laps on this current fuel run so i believe we might see some green flag pit stops before the end of the stage considering we still have another 13 laps before the end of the stage but uh as you said you know running a little more clean as you see now these guys have been running single file so they're actually starting to catch that front pack you can see them a little further up there they're entering the corner now they're actually coming up on some lap cars. Going to get by them, no issue at all. But with them running single file like that, they're going to be a freight train coming up to that lead pack. This might show the gap a little better. This is from Logan Hamilton's perspective up to Chris Horn, who is a lap car up with those guys in the front. This is from the back end of uh, the car in front of Chris Horn. And this is Zach Arnold in that number 10. You see them there in the wings just kind of waiting, waiting for their turn. You mentioned the pit stops, they're coming soon. Not quite this lap, it looks like. No, we do have some coming. Wes Wigand, a very late duck out of the group. Here come a few more. I think I saw, oh gosh, who was that that dipped down with Wes Wigand? That was, oh, that was Chris Horn actually in the 01 car. Looks like, who is that coming through the screen? The 31 as well. So multiple cars coming down the pit lane here on lap 48 to 49 of 100. Keep in mind the racing to the completion of lap number 60 here in stage number two. That's where points will be paid to the top 10 drivers. That's where we'll get our stage break caution flag. Let's take a look at the weather. We haven't done that all night tonight, just before these guys pit. 
right around 84 and a half degrees ambient, 87 degrees on the track. Very strong winds, actually, I'd say, for uh, an iRacing event. 15 miles per hour out of the southeast. Looks like most of these guys a lot to stay on the racetrack. One more lap, Joe. How important is it to keep running laps and make sure you can keep on the racetrack until the very last second? Well, I think, obviously, if you get a yellow flag and you have your competitors a lap down, that's a pretty big uh, help to you. But just running it out further maybe lets you fill up less fuel when you come down the pit lane. Less time on pit road, you should be able to make up time on the racetrack. But another big thing is really important about what's going on right now is you see they're all drafting together. When you come through the pits, you have a very high chance that when you come back out onto the track, you're going to be separated from the cars around you, or at least the cars that were around you before you pitted. That's something that you can see on your screen right now. Only three cars at the front end of this one as you see a couple more guys coming into the pit lane. The drafting and that extra speed you're getting out of that opportunity to run in the draft with other cars and punch a hole in the air that lets a couple more cars through. That's what's really going to be gained right now is their speed from staying in line with each other. Yeah, that's mainly why you see a lot of people, you know, even in real life NASCAR or even on the sim, you see guys pit in groups. You don't really see a lot of single car action. That being so, because you want the draft, because going by yourself, you're going 10 to 15 miles an hour slower than somebody that is in the draft. So obviously having draft is going to have you, you know, obviously go faster, but. As Ryan Duke comes into the pit lane, looks like we lose Trey Patton again. Having some troubles this evening, uh, even here in the commentary booth as wow, Zach Arnold. I don't think that was pit speed. I dare say that'll be a pit penalty for the number 10 car. Uh, the 49 has to readjust. That's Anthony Masadi. A lot of newcomers, and uh, seems like, oh, they're definitely having some pit troubles. Joseph Joseph as well, having to try and recenter in his box. It's tough to do here at Daytona, especially. You're going 200-some miles an hour. Suddenly, you've got to get down to 55, and then you've got to stop in your box. And if you have an early box in pit lane, it's even that much more difficult. It is tough, and sometimes it's really difficult to find your pit sign. In the mess of colors that is pit road, Joe, it's very, very tough to actually see where you've got a pit. Yeah, that's a great point, Andrew. And on top of that, it is a really great example of the same situation that these drivers are facing right now is if you're driving your car, so imagine yourself on an interstate on a freeway and you have to pull off on an exit, surely there's been an experience in your time where you've come off the exit and you have the corner to make to go off onto another respective road and you, you come into the turn and you're just going so fast because you're used to, visually, you're used to going so quick on the interstate itself that when you go off of the exit, you don't really realize that you're still going 50 miles an hour. If they come off of the racing surface and they're not necessarily aware that they're actually still 20, 30 miles an hour faster than pit road speed, which is, you know, obviously you need to hit pit road speed before you enter the pits to avoid the penalties. And, and timing it right is really crucial too, to make sure you don't lose too much time. But by the same token, you're going to bite yourself in the butt if you come in too quickly and just gun it a little bit longer than you should have. And coming into pit lane, hitting your marks is also very important. And we saw a couple guys make that mistake on pit road this time. That it's, it's tough to hit the right spot in your box. And obviously, if you're too close or too far from the wall, that is going to stop you from having your crew service the car. So those are the small intricacies that go along with being a good racer on track. You have to be a good racer in the pit lane if you want to stay competitive and stay up front. You saw the onboard of Kyle Green working with uh, Taylor Butcher Benjamin with Stephen Parrott following behind him. They're trying to work that outside line. Looks like Taylor Butcher Benjamin's going to get a slight edge coming out of turn two. Not going to do it. Looks like Kyle Green's actually got a little bit of damage on that right rear. Looks like it's not really hindering his car right now as we're on board with Stephen Parrott. You can see a really good view of that damage on that right rear. But that outside line getting a surge going into turn three. Taylor Butcher Benjamin. Ooh, a big bobble there coming out of Kyle. Looks like that outside line surge is going to be halted there as we come out of turn four. This is not for the lead. Keep in mind, Holden McGill, Jack Ryan, they're all alone up front. And here they are, the 21 and the 2, leading the way. Lap 55 of 100. That was six to go 
at the line for stage number two. The AOD racing to behind the number 21. And then you have that gap back to Taylor Butcher Benjamin, the third place machine. But how about this comeback for the number one car? Of course, we saw that incident earlier on where Chris Horn turned him around. He has been able to work himself back up almost where he started. One car spinning. Oh my, I'm not sure who that was. We do have a caution flag, and this changes everything. Yeah, you're certainly right about that, Andrew. This is completely changing the way this stage ends. It's, before we go forward with the caution itself, I do want to also uh, say this, that Andrew was correct. I mean, Butcher Benjamin just had an up and down right there. Awesome to see that one car charge back up to third place, and we'll sit there right now as we see what comes of the caution itself. But, Trey, we got a replay to show everybody. Somebody just slid on down in through third, turn three. Looking down here, Wes Wigan and Andrew Cootie. Uh, Wes Wigan just gets sent right on around. Andrew Cootie just looked like he hit him in the... I wasn't sure if that was the left rear or the right rear, but just... Look, he just straight-lined him. I mean, obviously, maybe no malicious intent, but that's exactly what happened. We're going to get another look at that here for you guys so we can get another angle of that. And this is going to be leading all the way up to what happens. So, uh, Wes Wigan was in the middle of that pack we were talking about with Butcher Benjamin and Parrot and everybody else. So, you see Kyle Green there as well. And there was a big run from the bottom side. Wes Wigan pops up to about the middle right here. And Andrew Cootie goes where there's really not a whole lot of room. And this is actually a great time for us to mention that LTAC does enforce the double yellow line on the inside of the racetrack here at Daytona and at Talladega. So, make sure to watch that here from the front end. Of, uh, of Cootie's car. Now, it's going to be very, very close if there's actually a car with... I mean, it is so close that on lap 55, it's hard to argue you should put the car there, but he obviously saw a way to better his race. That hole closed up, and it turned the 55 car right around. Yeah, I mean, you can't blame Cootie for trying to go for a gap that's there. Obviously, there's enough room or not, is, is, at least it looks like in that moment there's enough room to go down the inside and Wes Wiggins trying to stay clean as well I think it's just that when you go for that gap and you're so close together any small inch of sideways movement from either car is going to get you hooked together and we've talked about it at Daytona the the right rear the left rear it's just getting on that quarter panel of the the car in front of you is just prone to spin them out and it's tough to deal with it's it's just a part of racing on super speedways you're going so fast and that is a problem spot on the build of these cars that's the place you don't want to make contact and unfortunately Wes Wigan got caught up in that one not too much damage on that car he should be perfectly fine to get that repaired get back out on track and be able to compete further into this race you know I kind of agree with the maybe a little too early to make a move like that but you got to factor in, we're coming up on the end of stage two. So, you know, trying to better his race. I see what he was going for, but I can also back. It might be a little bit too early to make that move. Obviously, there was a gap there. But, I mean, my personal opinion, th there wasn't enough for him to get there. And as you mentioned, a little bit of sideways movement, just even just the slight tap can send somebody around. And that's exactly what we saw with Wes Wigan there. He just, unfortunately, was on the short end of the stick there and that sent him around but i guess luckily luckily for him uh not much damage and not really much position loss because he was actually a lap down so that still leaves andrew cootie in the top 10 at a potential chance to maybe if we go green before the end of this stage that he might be able to get back up there and get some more stage points well trey patton i can confirm we're going back green flag racing before this stage is over. In fact, we've just received the one to green signal, which means not only are we having one lap to settle this stage like before, we actually get two laps to settle stage number two. So I guess we're just following along with the stage number or something. So I guess we'll have three laps to go on a lace, uh, restart later on, I suppose, to finish up this race. But that means Holden McGill has to hold off this entire field for two whole laps without the aid of his teammate this time Grant Peterson definitely going to change things up I'd say for the front of the field you re-enter guys like Taylor Butcher Benjamin now Logan Hamilton up there Roy Grande Kyle Green Stephen Perriott and so so many more 
And this is going to be a wild end, I'd say, to the second stage on the evening. Jack B. Ryan on the outside can't overlook that number two car. Remember, he had that block earlier on in what I think is a moment that sticks out to me anyways, where his AOD racing teammate decided, no, he wanted to race. And, and that is just one of those kinds of moments where, hey, Dale Jr. said it before, you've got to be selfish in these races. Sometimes the... Uh, the team moniker, in this case, AOD Racing, in Dale's case, Hendrick Motorsports, it doesn't really mean a whole lot because you are racing for yourself, and especially in the case of Dale Jr., you're paid to go race. These guys, they can certainly win awards for themselves. So in a roundabout way, they are paid to go race and go win. That is the point of showing up to a racing event. Can't knock it. Lap 59 as we come around to the start-finish line. We go back green flag racing. Two laps to settle stage number two. Yeah, if you want to get nostalgic, you could call it a green-white checker. That's something a couple of us have grown up with in the NASCAR world. Butcher Benjamin got a good restart on the inside. He's charging up to the tail of McGill. You've got the 12 car. Hamilton on the inside of Ryan. They're still side-by-side -side there for the third position. Out of turn number two, there's nose to tail. Butcher Benjamin pushing McGill down the backstretch. We'll see if he wants to maybe duck out in three and four or if he's going to save it for the last lap of stage number two. So Miguel got a pretty decent jump on the rest of the field in that restart. If he would have got any more, that would not have worked out in his favor because he would have just been a sitting duck. They would have linked up and just drove right on by him. But luckily for him, that did not happen. You're going to see Butcher Benching go to the top side, and he will claim the top side and will almost clear them going into turn one. Looks like he's got the spot right now, but he's not able to get down to the bottom side. On board, looking for the back end. Oh, he gets... Oh, is he going to save it this time? He does! Taylor Butcher Benjamin almost gets turned and turned to the second time. The whole field scatters, mixing and moving all around the back straightaway. Logan Hamilton to the bottom side of Jack Ryan. Almost some contact, some more... Three wide in turn number three to settle stage number two. Boy, it's shaping up like it's going to be another Holden McGill stage win. What can Hamilton do out of turn number four? Goes to the bottom side, but goes below the yellow line. How will race control see that across the line? He does not advance his position. The caution flag comes out, and Holden McGill somehow holds on to win stage number two. Two. It's the second stage win for him this afternoon, this evening, this night. Wow! If you want to see something exciting, you're in the right place. That last lap coming to the end of this stage, I mean, coming down the backstretch, you, you had so many cars all over the place wiggling like crazy. That was crazy to see. And then obviously Hamilton coming to the line, he wants to try to make that pass on Holden McGill to get the stage win unfortunately did dip down below the two yellow lines and i do think there might have been some hesitation just to make sure that there were no rules broken because any sort of penalty could take you out of second place and obviously getting the stage points for second place is a good way to end it and gives you some nice position to start off the final stage and the charge to the finish but obviously a good race for holden mcgill to hold on to that race lead throughout it and hold the back the pack of hungry cars all charging towards him if anybody has to be upset with the way that went down, Taylor Butcher Benjamin almost got taken out there again, but somehow was able to find and wheel that machine to save it and ended up finishing in the top 10. So at least this time he is getting stage points and will not uh, have a damaged race car. So at least he's got some points on the day as of right now. So, I mean, I'd say in that case, that's still a win in his book. It is still a win in the form of the you know, fact he gets back up to the top 10, gets those points, and is able to help his season as a whole moving forward. But certainly when he's got a chance to go for the stage win, and it's taken from him again just by racing, of all things, that's going to sting, and that's going to sting for a while there for Taylor. But, hey, he's got a chance to do it all over again over the next 40 or so laps to the completion of stage, or sorry, lap 100 i guess the completion of stage three if you will the final stage here at daytona you see the whole field coming down pit lane getting tires getting fuel 
I mean, what do you do here if you're one of these drivers trying to make up spots? Do you tank tires or do you decide, you know what, I don't need that little bit of extra grip, I'll, I'll run without? You know, it's tough at Daytona, Andrew, because the tires are obviously important. They're important anywhere you go. As you see a couple of guys on your screen sliding through their pit stalls, but tires are important anywhere you go. But at Daytona, you'd think, you know, you're running on the super speedway. The turns aren't that sharp. It's not as much about the grip, but maybe two tires. Maybe that's a, a way to go about it. Or maybe four tires get all that grip. Maybe no tires get out of the pits first and try to lead the pack. It, there's just so many routes you can take strategically as you run towards the end of this race. And I think with as much time as we have left and the inevitable need for more pit stops in the future, if you didn't take any tires right now, I think you'd be in an okay spot to hopefully hold on for a while and stay at the front until another cycle comes through that you can get some fresh rubber and be even faster on the racetrack. We're going to bring in Logan Hamilton into the booth. Our state or P2 finisher in stage number two. We got Logan Hamilton. So quite a run there. Uh, we see Taylor Butcher Benjamin almost got hooked around again there. Just talk us through what happened there. Uh, honestly, it was quite nerve wracking. I was sure they were going to wreck at some point, And then I kind of got a run got clear of Taylor and I figured I'd try to fake him up the track and then went back down to the bottom. I thought I was going to get a penalty cause I went onto the line, but it was all good. I think I missed out on the stage by just a little bit, but I'm just glad I got a P2 finish out of that. Yeah, definitely a P2 is going to help your night a lot better versus not getting any points at all. So right now you're currently sitting in six loading into the latter half of this race. We got about, uh, about 35 laps to go. So what, is uh i guess in your mind the strategy call here you guys are gonna have to pit again obviously uh, at least one or two more or at least two more times so just talk us through that uh do you think we will see some green flag pit stops or do you think we'll just see more pit stops under yellow um i mean we got we got our green flag stops there which i was pretty happy about i got to try out not missing my pit road like i did at talladega in the preseason but um I think we can get at least one green flag pit stop. I, I'll probably take just gas. We get a green flag and then second stop, maybe take tires or take tires if they get a yellow. I really don't know. I'll have to talk to my A&W racing teammates of Lauren, Lauren McFadden and Roger Shelton about it. Well, with the aggression level of the field we've seen, it's been quite aggressive, you know, especially on these restarts. Um, so just as, as, as the race has unfolded, um, do you think these guys are going to be a little more um tame i guess you could say considering the fact that there is still 36 laps to go or do you think they're just going to be pedaled uh pedal to the metal and just just try to send it and try to make it to the end uh they'll probably take it easy for about 10 laps and then they'll or maybe till 10 to go they'll think it's fine then they'll hear that and they'll go but this tucson sound art ford mustang's fast and i think we can go get it today all right man that's about all we got for you we're gonna send you back and you're about to go green, so hopefully we'll be talking to you later on. We got a delayed green, but thank you. Enjoy the race. All right, that is our P2 finisher in Stage 2, Logan Hamilton. So as we reform the field for you, Joshua Abbey, P1, and then it's Zach Arnold, and I, I believe both of those two stay out. Everybody else pits, so Holden McGill, Taylor Butcher Benjamin, Anthony Musadi now make up your top five. Then it's Logan Hamilton that we just spoke with. Jeremy Berger, John Fallon, Mitchell Goosens, Mario Lapinta, your top ten. Uh, Roy Grande sits 11. Then it's Curtis Martin, Nate Brooker, Landon Nerhold, Brett Fisher, Lauren McFadden in 16th, Jack Ryan 17th. How about that for a drop under the caution period? Mason Thompson 18th, Andrew Cootie 19th, and Kevin Franks. Your top 20. What an evening of racing. You know what? We've gotten so caught up with everything. We haven't even talked about our great partners at Permanent Makeup and Cryo in Maine just yet. But let's just make sure everybody knows that when it comes to your appearance, you deserve the best care that money can buy. And at Permanent Makeup and Cryo in Maine, the owner, Ashley Boyer, is a certified micropigmentation specialist who provides professional, safe, and personalized services. You can contact Permanent Makeup and Cryo in Maine at permanentmakeupinmaine.com. 
or even call or text them at 207-358-8683. If you're looking for the best solutions for your permit makeup concerns, give them a call today to book a consultation. If you visit their Facebook page, Permanent Makeup in Crown Island, Maine, you can enter one of their monthly giveaways. Enter today, and who knows, you might just win. Also, of course, a massive thank you to Tucson Sound Art and Whiplash Media, always working through these broadcasts with us. We will ride with just the sounds of the engines here for a lap on this restart. We'll go on board, listen to some of these guys, get up through the gears, and rejoin you in a moment. That's a lap of the Daytona International Speedway, and Joe, we get a chance to listen to these guys come through the gears, look at how close they are on these restarts once more, and now on lap 67 of 100, we're back green flag racing, and we have a totally different picture ahead of us. Now, instead of 30 laps the race distance, we have 40, and really, part of that's even cut into with the addition of a few laps, or I guess the uh, subtraction of a few laps via our stage break, so really, it's about 35 laps that these guys have to race instead stage number three yeah so even though they had those couple laps under caution to begin stage three 35 laps is still longer than either stage one or stage two was up to this point so obviously right at this moment these guys have the same strategy that they had at the beginning of stage one and stage two which is just to form up into some lines and draft with each other work their way through a couple laps try not to get into any major incidents or anything that takes them out of contention for this race but over the long term and i say long term sparingly because it's only five extra laps but trey at that same time those five laps are a huge difference in the way that these guys are going to want to run this stage Exactly. Five laps feels like eternity, especially when you're coming to the end of a race. You know, you expect it. You're used to doing a 30 lap run. You know, those five extra laps, that's almost five extra minutes that you got that they're on the track for. So, I mean, these guys got to strategize and think of, OK, well, we're out here for a little extra longer. So, I mean, like I said before earlier, these guys are going to be doing I think they're going to have at least two more pit stops. I could be wrong on that, but I think they're going to have two. But so that's just going to play into factor. Actually, that might limit there because we have a caution on the track. The caution flag is out. And oh, we've got somebody going up and over that uh, kind of bump out of the road course here at Daytona International Speedway. What has happened here? Robert Mathis involved, and it looks like likely a few others. Let's take a look back at it here and check it all out. So this is Robert Mathis. This is going a ways back. This is out of turn four. This is all going to happen out of the tri-oval. We're watching the black and neon numbered 95 on the top of the screen. Oh, and Bradley Walters just gets into him. And how about how long those two were backwards? Oddly enough, the 95 and 59 are the two that wreck right here. And if you just turn a 95 around, it is the 59 of Bradley Walters. How about that for some number fun? Well, yeah. Drivers getting caught up in this incident. Obviously, Mathis just got backwards, and I, I think the two of them just ran out of racing room. It seemed like they weren't really trying to get into anything like that, but you see the 59 gets a nice run out of turn number four, a good bit of momentum. He sticks his nose down there. He's actually in the middle of a three-wide situation, is Bradley Walters, and then they just kind of come up and over with each other. Nothing they could do to avoid that at that point in time, but Pretty interesting to see not only the 95 rolling backwards for so long, but also to see Bradley walk on the inside of the run down to turn number one. Yeah, it's not something you typically see here at Daytona. You know, just two cars getting together like that, especially going down and hitting a bump like that, getting a little bit of airtime. 
usually the only airtime you see is when one car goes up and over. We're going to get another shot of this from the flag stand and the tri-oval. You're going to see it there. You get a little sideways right there. It spins out. And then obviously you see right here that they're still together going down the track, spinning out, trying to get off of each other, and then hitting that bump, getting airborne. Good props to the 59 machine there for holding onto that race car for as much as he could because he could have definitely went spiraling into that inside. So with a caution flag, we get a chance to reset everything under this new caution period, and it's definitely some pit stops taking away and uh, changing things up for much of the field, but much of the field also stays out. Looks like the entire top 10 going to do so. The first taker we have is going to be Zach Arnold now leaving the pit lane. It seems in the number 10 car, he will exit into 13th position. And that is just, like I said, just outside of the top 10. So 12 cars staying out. I, I'm not so sure Trey Patton, these guys would have had to make two pit stops anyway, but now I think whether you stay out or whether you pit, this erases any possibility of two pit stops in this final stage. It should just be the one pit stop straight up to the end with a 50% fuel limit. I would imagine it's just a matter of when you come in, if you want to try and go a little bit further, lead some laps, uh, and try and catch the rest of those guys on a, on a caution, or if you just want to get that uh, pit stop out of the way. It really comes down to driver and team preference as well. But you guys were mentioning Joshua Abbey, front of the field, a familiar face right now. He is on the, uh, the flat of the racetrack, and that's something you usually see to save fuel and to make sure you're able to pick up fuel in a real NASCAR cup car because it forces the fuel over to the right side of the car and over into the pickup, uh, just like you would have at speed as opposed to it sloshing over to the left side of the fuel cell uh, if you're just running on the banking at 50 60 miles an hour it's not going to have the g-forces to force over to the side that the pickup is on so I i'm not sure that you have to do that here in i racing but it's a cool detail regardless yeah and certainly joshua abby's trying to take the shortest line around because at this moment in time the shortest way is the fat is the fastest way and the best way to go in terms of conserving fuel which is obviously what that 05 car is going to want to do as they come back to the green having not pitted at the stage break or pitted on this caution i think another interesting factor of this is the strategy of only having five tire sets to deal with for the entirety of this race that's something that these drivers have to think about when they get these yellows but trey quickly before the green it seems like we had a little bit of an incident under yellow is that correct yeah it looked like there's a little bit of a mix-up between the 01 and the 04 uh looks like from what i heard from race control it looked like a little bit of a hardware issue with the 01 hit the wall and came down collected the 04 not sure how much damage the 04 has but nonetheless happened under yellow something we didn't catch but uh, didn't really affect how the race is going as we are under yellow still, but we are going to go green and hopefully these guys can keep it going and we got a good uh, good race going down here and hopefully it can be entertaining for us and all of you guys watching. Just inside of 30 laps to go. In fact, we've got 28 coming up next up. It's lap 72 of 100. So yeah, if my math serves me correctly, 28 laps to go from this point in time as we come back to a green flag. It's been quite the doozy this evening for the Tucson Sound Art 250. Seven cautions for now what will be 24 laps. But look at that. Seven lead changes. That number is only going to rise as these guys get right back into it. Joshua Abbey, Taylor Butcher, Benjamin, your front row. Then it's Holden McGee. Gill, Logan Hamilton, P3, P4 as we get back going at Daytona. Up and into the banking in turns one and two. Through the gears they go, and they should be hitting fourth gear just about now. Almost at speed. You see them already dodging and moving all around in the draft. You don't have to fan out quite like you do at Pocono, but certainly trying to find exactly where you want to be behind the car in front of you and make the use of that draft. Yeah, absolutely. The draft is really key to get your momentum up and especially on the restarts to catch back up to full speed. Joshua Abbey did have a very experienced front runner in this race behind him, though, with the number 21 car, McGill, on his tail. And you see out of his rear bumper, 
McGill's definitely staying close to Joshua Abbey, making sure he knows that this is not going to come easily to him. And running in the top spot right now, the Texan in the number 05 machine doesn't quite have to worry about as much of a run off of Butcher Benjamin at the moment in time. But coming out of turn number two, as you see McGill giving him a nice shove into the outside and a nice shove coming from Hamilton onto Taylor Butcher Benjamin's rear end. And the number one car is going to be taking over the race lead and ducking down to the inside. That's a strategy call we were talking about much earlier on in this race track. Yeah, definitely, you know, as we said, playing the Pied Piper role there, you know, Butcher Benjamin able to clear the inside line. As you mentioned before, having a lot of these experienced plate uh, plate drivers, if you will, you know, they know what they're doing. And that's what that's who you want to have behind you. You want somebody that knows how to push somebody that has a little bit of patience that will work with you as we, oh, car into the wall. Not quite sure who there was. They're wrecking further on back the 30 car up and over. It's yet another big, big one here at Daytona International Speedway. You see the number 30. Oh, you see Pattengale lock it down behind all of that. Try not to hit the number 30 car of uh, of Brett Fisher right there. And he was tumbling for just a hot minute. We'll take a look back at it. We'll see exactly how this all transpires to bring out our eighth caution flag of the evening, our eighth stoppage of green flag racing. You see the number 30 of Brett Fisher. It starts up ahead of him, though. Let's take a look at what happens to Fish. Oh, my. He just gets clobbered by the nine of Cootie after the wreck happens. Uh, let's go and try and find out exactly what happens with all of that. Somebody got turned, as is uh, per usual, pretty much. And I believe it was possibly the number 18 car that we're looking for. Uh, of Roy Grande, and yes, I do believe it was. We'll take one more, at least one more look back at things, try to figure out exactly what goes on. Yeah, so you're currently watching with Grande. He's running in front of Jack Bryan. The number 10 car 2 is outside as well. They come into that first turn, and uh, that was a little bit of net code right there. Sends him up into the outside wall. Obviously, when you're in a big pack like this, it's very easy for a to just exponentially get worse and unfortunately it caught all the rest of them out the 30 car flipping violently through turn two as well from a result of that one but just something that it, it seems like you couldn't avoid that one because it, it, it's a little bit of a, uh, a software a connection issue that seems to be causing this caution watching it here on board with jack ryan you see the 18 car roy grande right diagonal to the left of or to the right excuse me you're going to see it here. He's going to, oh, yeah, that was definitely some net code. Had about a whole. But unfortunately, you know, with iRacing, uh, obviously with servers, you know, it's not the real thing. So we can't perfect it all the way through. We get pretty dang close to it. But unfortunately, that's just part of it. And pretty unfortunate for him that he was the victim of said tragedy. But nonetheless, we are still green. And looking up further in this field, there's some guys up here that we haven't really said or talked much about. We got Anthony Masati sitting in fourth place right now. John Fallon in sixth place. Yeah, Taylor Butcher, Benjamin, and company all stay out here. And it looks like we are going to have, let's see, five that do so. Jack Ryan, the first car, that pitted. And that number two actually looking a little bit worse for wear. I think he's just trying to hang on. Definitely has some rear end damage to this point on the left, on the right, on the very back end. Whole lot going on there for the number two, Joseph Joseph. He's got some damage on his car, but that actually, that DeWalt Chevrolet is looking mostly okay. If there's any damage, yeah, there is a bit on the left front. Not so bad. Joshua Abbey, he pits, and I'd imagine this should be, I think they're trying to make this their final stop, but I think they're still going to have to go a ways. Uh, possibly just the lengthening the point or the, the amount of time obviously they can run without having to pit again um, But I, I do think this is still just a little bit too far for these guys to go on fuel It's very very close, but I think we're still about four laps too far Yeah, I would agree with you Andrew I do believe if we got enough yellow those guys could maybe get to the checkered flag without pitting but aside from those yellows it does seem a little far we had been seeing them come in at about 17 18 up into maybe 20 laps of green flag running in the first two stages before we saw the drivers coming down the pit lane so if the previous set of 77 now 78 laps is going to tell us anything about 
the way these these cars are going to finish this race about the way that we're going to get to the checkered flag. We're expecting all of those drivers we just saw come out of the pit lane return in the future. But Trey, maybe they're banking on a caution. Maybe they're banking on a late race caution to maybe get some fresh tires on and just enough fuel to make it to the end at the very late stage of the race and maybe have some good fresh rubber underneath them and have a light car that can carry them to the front at the checkered flag. That's an excellent point. I mean, banking on a caution is always something you can do at Daytona. I mean, the rate this race is going, you know, you you said it yourself earlier. Cautions breed cautions. We've seen a fair bit of cautions here today, but that doesn't mean we'll see another one. But at the rate this race is going, we're getting down to crunch time. We're getting almost into 20 laps to go in this race. These guys are going to be aggressive. They're going to be trying to get to that front. They want to get the win. It's not about stage points. It's about getting that win. They're going to do whatever it takes. And this is where selfish driving comes into play here. You're going to see that within the, you know, maybe not now, but when it comes to about five laps to go, maybe even three, but you're going to see these guys making those aggressive moves that we were talking about earlier on in this race. You're going to see a lot of those. 22 laps to go now in the Tucson Sound Dart 250 miler at Daytona International Speedway to open up the second season, the 2021 season of the LTAC Cup Series. How about it? It's been quite the event so far. We'll actually take one more lap around this 2.5 mile super speedway before getting racing once again, which means we'll have 21 to go on a lap's time. Taylor Butcher, Benjamin, your race leader, see Logan Hamilton there, Holden McGill. We've talked a lot about that 21 car. We've talked to him as well. In fact, we've also talked to Logan Hamilton in second place. How about that? The two drivers we've actually talked to so far this evening, not only are they 21 and 12, reverse of the same number, but they are in second and third, hanging on to those front running positions. Uh, quite interesting, actually. Usually we get a mix of uh, where these guys end up, but I suppose when uh, one of those two drivers has swept both stages, the other one was second place in the other, uh, I guess that's going to happen. The cream does rise to the top, even here at Daytona. Just over 20 laps to go, Joe. I'm going to put you on the spot. Who do you pick to win? You know, that's really tough to call because we've got so many guys who've been staying up at the front throughout the course of this one. I'm looking at the top three right now. I think those are the guys that you'd want to keep your eye on to the checkered flag. And I know mcgill has been leading the way as much as he has, but I really like the way Logan Hamilton got out of that final corner at the end of stage two. I think he learned from his mistake going too far down, hitting that yellow line. If I had to put my money on anybody, which is a tough thing to do at Daytona, I'll tell you that. But if I'm going to pick anyone, I'm watching the 12 car. You know, Logan Hamilton, not a bad choice. But just from watching, you know, and following LTAC last season, you got to put, you got to watch Taylor Butcher Benjamin. This guy knows how to get around these plate tracks. He knows how to get around anything. You know, he's a very seasoned driver, very experienced, knows what he's doing, and knows how to get to victory lane. So, I wouldn't count him out on this. Solid picks for sure. You know what? If I'm going to take somebody, I'm going to look down here. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but 15th place, Frank Flores, he's speaking to me. The green flag is going to fly. We have 21 laps to go. How am I going to defend my pick for Frank Flores? I don't know, but something is speaking about the 23 car to me this evening. The one car leads. It's Taylor Butcher Benjamin. The 21 passes the 12. Here comes Anthony Mosadi down to the bottom side, and he is, what we're told, teammates with... Uh, Holden McGill there. So a couple of teammates working together. We saw that earlier on with Holden McGill. It didn't end well for said teammate. We'll see if it works better out this time around. Up on 20 laps to go. Taylor Butcher Benjamin still on the point. Holden McGill behind him. Masadi behind him. The teammate Zach Arnold been up front most of the race see him slotted in fourth joseph joseph behind him in fifth pretty single file going on back throughout the top 10 looks like we don't have really any side-by-side -side action until you get further back in the pack probably about 15th or so but nonetheless you see here actually some side-by-side -side action there with the 99 or with the 98 excuse me and the 29 mitchell goosen's making his way back up into the top 10 
Yeah, something's going on here with Logan Hamilton. Certainly some damage on the front end of this machine. And now these guys are doing much like they did at the start of the race. They are settling in. It looks like they want to get some laps complete real quick. They want to get some laps under all their belts. Most of the field good to go for a, a solid amount of laps. But Taylor Butcher, Benjamin, Holden McGill, Anthony Musadi, and actually even Logan Hamilton. They're going to have to pit here soon. They've stayed out for a couple of yellows at this point. And they don't have too many laps left to go on fuel. We'll see exactly how it works out for all of them. And uh, meanwhile, again, very single file towards the front of the field. And everything is very, very calm. This is the calmest we've seen things, I think, since lap one or two, Joe. This is very uncharacteristic compared to the rest of the race. Not quite sure if we've lost Joe or not, but as you say, we're calm right now. But as we say, as you might say, this is, it could be the calm before the storm. You know, things are pretty calm and fair and tame right now. But, you know, we're in that 20 laps to, or within that 20 laps to go, Mark. We're just counting down and ticking away the time here. 18 laps to go. These guys, you know, as we mentioned, it's going to be tied on fuel. That extra caution lap, that may have helped them a little bit, but I think they are still a little bit short, as you mentioned. So that's just going to open more opportunity, and it's just going to be wild to see what these guys do. You see a little bit of moving around up front right there with the 10, Zach Arnold, Joseph Joseph behind him, and Jack Ryan behind him actually on board now with with Joseph Joseph. You see that little bit of moving around like I mentioned. We said that earlier. These guys may not be on the freshest tire, so they might not have the best grip out there. But as you see, he's going to get a great run, going to get off the gas a little bit there. That's also going to help these guys save fuel. You don't want to be full throttle when you're trying to depend your uh, depend on saving fuel because the draft is going to help you carry momentum anyway. So you can actually be in the th draft right here and still be about half three quarters throttle. Yeah, being half three quarters th throttle is going to exponentially grow the amount of fuel you have left in the tank. And a lot of those guys who pitted earlier on that are trying to make it to the end of this race at that stage where Andrew had said you aren't going to make it to the end from 20 plus laps out from the checkered flag. They're going to use this time as an opportunity to get closer and closer to the point where they could make it to the finish, sparing that we don't get another yellow. I do think it's really awesome that we've kind of calmed down. We're getting through these stages of the race because this is the point in the race where the, the heartbeats start raising a little bit. The adrenaline starts flowing a little bit more than it has maybe from since the beginning of the race itself. This is when it's starting to get to crunch time. It's really nice that we're taking these laps off, but just hold on because I'm sure they're going to start racing each other really hard as the laps close down. Oh, absolutely. A whole lot happening right now. Even though it looks like nothing is happening. I mean, the field is single file. It looks like everybody's being very calm. But everybody's planning. Everybody's trying to figure out exactly how they're going to run the rest of this race. And I think that's why they're single file, is they're taking this time mentally to just think this through, which is good considering we've had a very odd first 80 laps or so to this race. And everybody was very gung-ho from the start. Let's just immediately race. And we saw the result of that. A lot of incidents happened. But you know what? That's what's going to happen in the first race of a new season with a bunch of new drivers. They all want to be the new star, of course. They want to go out there and they want to assert themselves as being at the top dog. As we look at the bulldog at the back end of this 97 car, that that was initially pun unintended, but I'll take the credit for it. As 15 laps to go the last time by the line, these guys that are short on fuel, they're trying to plan exactly when they want to pit, how they're going to try and save a little bit of fuel. That said, if you're Taylor Butcher Benjamin, you have to run flat out right now. You're leading the race. You can't save anything. Yeah, Taylor doesn't really have much of a choice up at the front end of the field. He could pull out a line, let McGill by, and maybe slot in behind him, but that just runs the risk of falling further and further back into the field and, you know, losing the track time, which at this point in the race, you can't be losing any time on the course. I mean, 14 laps to go. There's still time to make big moves and to maybe come back from a further position, but obviously... Uh, if you're at the front of the field, I know Taylor isn't going to want to let up too much time and fall too far back, especially to the hungry driving that the 21 car has been doing. McGill's been pushing that machine all race long. He's been at the front end of the field, won stages. I mean, he's on the charge. I think that's the person that you're watching the most at this stage in the race if you're racing in front or behind him. 
Look at here, we're gonna see cars come into pit road as you just, as we just said. Taylor Butcher Benjamin gonna come in. Oh, looks like the 21 is actually gonna beat him into pit road. Excellent job. Very, very nice. Slats himself right in front of Taylor Butcher Benjamin. That right there is textbook. That right there is what wins you races. What is no wins? Oh my gosh, you know what? His jacks went up. I thought he had slid past the allowable place where iRacing lets you fool the car. No, we're actually going to see a change of the guard up here. We see three cars beat McGill out. Those being, it looks like, uh, oh, who was that? That was, uh, I want to say Jack Ryan. Yes, Jack Ryan in the two car. Joseph Joseph ahead as well. Uh, you even have Jeremy Berger beating them out. A very interesting pit strategy here from a lot of the field. Kevin Frank stays on the racetrack. He's now the race leader. This changes things up. If we get a caution flag now, oh, how this race completely changes. And suddenly these guys we've not really talked about the entire race are the ones to beat. Kevin Franks, Mitchell Goosens, Robert Mathis, and more, who was in that race, or sorry, in that wreck a little while ago with Bradley Walter. Suddenly Mathis could be back in this. And uh, I'll toot my own horn a little bit. How about Frank Flores? If we get a caution flag, he's sitting sixth. But uh, certainly everything changing. That said, it could all change back to about what we had here in just an incident. If these guys pit, we'll wait to see what they do out of turn number four. Do they pit now or wait some more? They wait some more. Yeah, I'm telling you, if Frank Flores puts that card in victory lane, that would be one heck of a psychic move from Mr. Cardinale to call that so far back. But you talk about these guys up at the front that we haven't really spoken on behalf of. Goosens was up at the front at the beginning of this race, but it's been a while since we saw that 29 running up as far as second place. Obviously, Franks is leading his first laps of the race. And then Mathis, we had seen Mathis involved in an incident earlier on. You see the way that you can just fight your way back up to the front and let the strategy play out that allowed the 95 car back into the top three right now. We're riding on board with Thompson just behind him and you're watching them single file right now. We're not quite sure when we could see these guys come into the pit lane. They come out of turn number four and they all look like they're gonna stay on the racetrack this time around. They might have saved enough or pitted late enough to possibly get themselves closer and closer to that finish and just hold on, wait for a possible yellow to help you out at the end. Further on back, there is a group of about six or seven cars that came into pit road. But you talk about these guys up front that we haven't heard much about. But if you look further back on your leaderboard there, you see Logan Hamilton two laps down. Apparently when he came into pit, he got caught with a speeding penalty. And apparently when he got into pit road, his engine expired. So a guy we've seen up front, you know, running in the top three, he's done. Oh, how the tides turn. And, I mean, I, I really don't have words for that. Logan Hamilton, we thought, was going to be one of the front runners, one of the guys to beat. In fact, he was just picked to win this race. I, I have nothing for that. That's, unfortunately, the way this goes sometimes. I would imagine there was very likely a money shift as he was trying to bring that car down to pit speed. It's very easy to do, of course. You can engine brake these cars to a point, but you've got to be very, very careful. And if you do, pop it into one gear too low, just a little bit too soon, just a few RPMs too soon, uh, suddenly that motor is going to let go. It's a very thin threshold here on the iRacing.com simulator. Nine laps to go, coming to eight. What will these front runners do? When do they pit? We know they still have to. They've already run now 16 laps on this fuel. Granted, some of those were under caution. How much further can they go? And if a caution flight comes out, does Kevin Frank suddenly become the driver to beat? Kevin Frank's being at the front end, I think that's certainly worth keeping an eye on if they can go green. This is the kind of racing that at the end of a super speedway race, a long race, this is the kind of stuff that really gets you on your toes. Are they going to be able to make it to the checkered flag? Are they going to have to come in to get pit stops? And not even just are they going to, but who's going to? These cars, you see a whole bunch of them in the top 10. They've pitted all at different plate points in the race so far. Goosens, Mathis, Franks up at the front end. But you look back in seventh place, Joshua Abbey, who pulled that big strategic move to not pit at the end of stage two. And now he's back up there. Obviously, you see the order is, is going to change up as we continue to count the laps off, but I think you can't even just assume the whole group is going to be working 
uh, on the same strategy, but it's just about which ones of them are going to come in at their own respective times and who can last the longest. You know, further on back as well, you know, you have that group of, you know, Joseph, Joseph, those guys that were running up front before, uh, before they decided to come in. So you got Joseph, Joseph, and then you got Anthony Masati and Nate Brooker, all those guys still further on back there, you know, within, you know, 10th place or so. These guys are still, I'm like 30 seconds behind the leader. So, I mean, if that comes down to play and they end up pitting and the guys behind them, like Landon Durhold and all of them, they're still 10 seconds behind the leader. If that comes into play with him and Joshua Abbey, these guys might be the guys who end up winning. Well, no, keep in mind, uh, Joseph Joseph, excuse me, in that group, they have made their pit stop. We're waiting on this group here that we're watching to make theirs, and actually we see, well, we can hear Mason Thompson fluttering the throttle a little bit down the back stretch. I mean, these guys are trying to save every single drop. They know that if they're out front when this caution flies, it's best case scenario for them. They have a chance. If they have to pit under green, they're written back out of it. What happens out of turn number four? Mason Thompson giving a big gap now, really feathering the throttle. Five laps to go. I'm surprised they've gone this long, to be honest with you. We're at 20 laps. I don't think they can go five more, but you know what? If you've got a chance to go from 20th or further on back to the front, you may as well see if you can. Yeah, I mean, what is to lose by just trying to strength, to lengthen this out right now? If you're running at the front end of the field, I mean, we talked about Goosens Goosen, and Mathis were both up at the front but then fell back. Frank's obviously now just getting up to the front and holding out up there. I mean, yeah, it's just what is your limit? How far are you willing to risk the biscuit right now to stay at the front end of the field? Obviously, there they come. So you see Goosen's coming down the inside of... Oh, he's actually losing control of that car. Uh, I was going to say good save, but he kept wiggling a little. But a good save by that 29 car to avoid a incident, although he did lose a little bit of time coming into the pit lane. So that answers our question of when these guys are start coming in. We are now at four laps to go, and Joshua Abbey has regained the race lead. So that right there, I was actually talking, it looked like that Landon Durhold was up there with those guys as well, or further on back. Uh, I think he may have come into pit. I'm not quite sure, but nonetheless... You know, Joshua Abbey, he's on a 19-lap stint right now. How much further can he go? He's on his own. He doesn't have somebody to break the air in front of him and save more fuel. I'm not really sure how he got into the situation on his own. I'd imagine his partner was on a different strategy, had uh, pitted prior to Abbey, and uh, had stayed out on the previous caution flag, and now he's left all alone. Can somehow, can some, can some way, can, can Joshua Abbey actually stretch three more laps on fuel where... He might go one more based on what uh, the, the other drivers on his strategy just did. I mean, I'd imagine he likely topped off at the end of the previous caution flag about 18 laps ago, maybe even 19 laps ago. But I'm not sure that you can get three more laps of fuel here, yet he is going to give it a shot. He's been as high as first, as low as 36, started 32nd. What if this 05 can do it? You know, he's got 12 seconds. He may as well just start rolling way out of the throttle. Use all of that up. Try and get everything you can. Yeah, I was just going to say the same. When you've got a gap like that, and obviously it's just going down and down and down, and here we go. Oh, so Joshua no. Abbey is going to relinquish that spot and come down to pit lane. Tough break for the 05 car, but he, he showed he was playing the strategy game, and I think if he would have gotten a break yellow somewhere in that mixed, he would have been the one to watch, obviously showing he went a couple laps further than the rest of them. But what that does, oh, actually, I was about to say, Holden McGill was taking over the race lead, but he actually got really loose out of the try over. We'll see what the uh, result of that will be. But that actually put the 49 car, Musadi, now taking over the race lead from Jack Ryan on the inside opportunity for Jack Ryan, Jeremy Berger, Joseph Joseph, John Fallon. These guys up front on the point. You know, as I said earlier, Masadi, the 49 car, not one we've really talked about much today. This right here, coming out of turn four, this is where we're going to see those moves. Come oh, on the 16th oh, turn, the caution flag comes out. We're not done. Oh, my gosh. 
John Fallon turned in front of the field. Oh my, oh. Kyle Green. I don't know how you, I don't know how you don't see that, guys. Well, there yeah, was a I car in front of him, but oh my, it, oh, oh my. Man, that was a tough break. I yeah, I'm wondering about Kyle Green. Obviously, he came up on that one and just didn't have the time and the reaction to not hit that 16 car but that is a tough break and you're, you're racing at the end of this one and you're coming you're at the front you're coming to two laps to go you're, you're gunning for position any position is more points and obviously it's just a bit the tail for the 16 car tonight looking at this we're gonna see here we're looking on board there's john fallon getting turned and hitting the outside wall luckily there no one else got collected so we thought pretty close call there gets turned around and stopped goes by and Kyle Green just absolutely full throttle straight into the 16 machine. You know, Andrew, I think you had a, a pretty solid uh, thing going on there with the cautions going at the end of stages. So I think you were right. It's falling the stage number. We're going to have three to go. Well, it, that was actually coming to the white flag. We'll, we'll have a green-white checkered momentarily. I... Well, we'll we'll get to the 76 car in a moment, but uh, let, let's first try and diagnose what happens here to John Fallon one more time. He, he's going to end up getting turned in the end by the two car, but how exactly does it happen? Who moves where, and how does this 16 get turned? That's what we want to know. We want to know exactly how this... You know what? I, I think he just came up the racetrack a little bit. It's so easy to do. Suddenly your sights are set on that flag stand. Where's the white flag? What can I do to win? And he just came up a little bit too far. And oh my gosh. We'll we'll get to the 79 car now because or 76 rather. <sighs> Questions for sure. Yeah, obviously, um, with Fallon already stopped on the racing track, I mean Green didn't you know, Green had time if he would have been able to see out of the front of that machine what was going on up there. Maybe he would have been able to avoid this one. You're on board with Kyle Green right now. So you see the smoke. You're checking up. You got the 13 in front of you. And he dives away. And, oh, yeah, just couldn't see it until yeah, he got there. I'm not there. sure he could do anything, to be honest. It, it looks really terrible from our broadcast cameras. You could argue he gets on the brakes a bit more. You don't really know exactly what you're coming up on. And... and you can tell he leaves the car in the grass, I think, knowing he just messed up. Uh, th there's the meme. Well, I'll just say that, where you know you messed up suddenly. I think that's that moment for Kyle Green. Uh, we'll watch it from uh, another angle that might show it. I mean, you just simply cannot see sometimes. And the 13 is going to come up in front of Kyle Green. I. Uh, the only thing he could have done is just back out further. But then why aren't the other guys around him backing out further? Suddenly, Lapinta moves and there's a car stuck there. I, it's, it's hard to argue that Kyle Green necessarily does anything wrong compared to the rest of the field around him. If he has to check up, why, doesn't the rest of the, why don't the rest of the cars around him? I, it's, it's so tough. I, I know it looks so bad, but it's so tough to argue that he really did anything terribly wrong. It's, unfortunately, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Sometimes you're the bug. Sometimes with the windshield, in this case, I think he was both. Yeah, I mean, that was a tough break for him. I'm, you're just coming up behind other cars, and, and you don't really expect uh, a whole vehicle stopped on the racing track right there. And especially, I know, Trey, you could probably talk from experience, too. I mean, when you're in the car and, and you're sitting... I think we just had a bit of a mic malfunction there for uh, Joe Johnahue. I think we heard a bit of a sigh. I, you know, I, I think his mic might have fallen because it sounded like it tumbled a little bit there. But, um, no, I, I, I want to touch back on, on, on the Kyle Green situation. Um, I, again, I, I know it looks so, so bad when you look at it at face value. But like Ryan Dingler said out in the in the YouTube chat, uh Quite simply, hindsight is 2020, and thankfully that's why 2020 is in the past. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so hard to, to say exactly what he should have done. And I, I go back to everybody around him is maintaining that same speed that he went. At. He did what everybody around him did, and suddenly there was a car in front of him. And uh, 
again, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. It looks really terrible for a car to suddenly just pile into a parked car 20 seconds later on, but I... It's, it's hard to say that he did anything wrong looking at the cars around him. That said, let's put that behind us. We've got a restart to focus on. Two laps to go. It's green, white, checkered. Out of 100 laps, we now have two more to go to make it 104. Anthony Masati, the race leader. Jeremy Berger, second place. The two-car Jack Ryan in there as well. How does this shake down? See, Jeremy Berger... Up on the top side, not quite of a run yet. These guys are still trying to get up to speed. Masati holding that bottom line very, very well. Ooh, I thought Brian was going to go up to the outside. There he goes, Joseph. Joseph going to slot himself into second onto the bottom side. You see Berger get a little bit of a bobble there. The outside line getting a slight bit of a run there. You see Stephen Parrott. We haven't heard seen much of him. So here is, oh, and they're wrecking. That's everybody. Oh, that's that's everybody. Down. Yeah, that's the whole field right there. Coming Holden back McGill again. just did a barrel roll out of turn four. Everybody's in this, and and we're still crashing. We're we're still crashing. We're still crashing. Oh my. Oh, we're still crashing up here. We're we're still we're creating new crashes. Oh boy. It's oh stressful. my. Well, if you wanted to shake up to your running order in any way, I mean, there you go. That's just gonna make the whole thing. It's going to realign everybody in the field. We'll get a replay, and I don't know if you can pick out one single car to follow through this one, because this, this included most of the cars left in this race. If you look at that, Landon I, Durhold I, I, <laughs> was I, the I, only person to get through that. I, I've never seen a crash quite like this. I, you know what? <laughs> we're, we're setting new marks every day. Uh, well, let, let's watch us back. Um, it looks like Joseph Joseph just, I mean, he's in the throttle. He has every right to be in, just hooks the 49. And, I mean, there, there's nowhere to go for anybody. Logan Durald, you're right. Gets through. Oh, somebody else. Who was that forward on the bottom side? I. Oh, you know what? That was Kevin Franks we were talking about a while ago. Oh, he might be in this thing. He's back in it, boys. Oh, my. I just... I, oh, I, I don't know. And that's a hard spot on the racetrack. Or it's the same as, as the entrance of turn three or the same with turns two and turn one. When you're going through that banking, obviously the change in the degrees of, of which the angle is for the track you're driving on, it upsets the balance of the weight of the car and it's hard to keep control of it and and while that didn't cause the yellow itself because obviously you see joseph joseph just trying to give the shove that he needs to get the momentum towards the front but it's it's this part of the turn it's where you get back into the banking change is where the rest of the field's going to have a problem because they're going to have to slow up and break which is going to completely throw all the weight to the to the front of the car and then you top it off with the L, the change in the angle that your car is sitting on it that just all that weight distribution is really hard to keep a hold of and if you can i mean props to you if you can but you can't blame the guys because that's just such a hard spot to be decelerating so quickly to try to avoid this wreck and obviously it happens so fast you can't even react in time we're gonna watch kevin franks go through this you see them starting to wreck a little bit in front he's gonna dive down to the apron gets a little bit loose you see landon Dorhold in front of him and he just gets away scot one of the few cars of the field that gets by Scott Free. That was spectacular. I mean, it's spectacular. You wouldn't think it would be spectacular, but that's not something you see every day. I want to bring Call actually back to this 98. I, I, I want to watch this one more time, just watching the TV camera from him. Uh, what, what What's incredible is when he dips onto the transition, we, we're talking about how uh, it can get you loose a little bit. Right here, you see that 98 pitch sideways? That might, that is absolutely what saved his race. If that car had not gotten loose just like that, he was in that crash, and, I mean, he's all kinds of wadded up. I, I don't know why that struck me as a little bit odd, a little bit interesting, but uh, it certainly did. Meanwhile, pace car lights are out. Check this out. The one car is our race leader, boys, Taylor Butcher Benjamin. I 
Oh, I feel for this bottom side. Yeah, I'm telling you, Taylor Butcher Benjamin, you see all the damage on that one car. That's definitely going to slow him up as they come back up through the gears and get back to full speed. I do think Durhold has a really great opportunity having kept that car clean and just absolutely shooting a gauntlet to get past that incident without any damage. That speed that Durhold's going to be able to carry with the car being in better shape, I think that's going to give him a great shot coming to the line to just gap him, get ahead, and hopefully block enough to stay there to the checkered flag. I'd be watching that 24 car on the top side to just start making a run because unfortunately Taylor Butcher Benjamin at no fault of his own is just now caught up in an incident that took a lot of the aerodynamics away from that car and I'm, unfortunately I think that one car is sitting down. A little shot in the dark here. Um, you know sometimes iRacing can be a little wonky with the damage. Uh, I, I've been a victim of that as well. So I've actually had a car that looked exactly like Taylor Butcher Benjamin's car, and it ran just like it was. there was no damage on it. So, I mean, like I said, shot in the dark, but you never know what could happen. You know, I'm, I'm still going with it. He's my pick. He's up front right now. Let's see what happens. I will keep your hopes alive. I don't want to crush your dreams, but I don't think that one's going anywhere. It does for now. He gets the jump on Durhold, but watch his 24 go right on by. There goes Diane and Durhold in the... Oh, my. The speed difference is incredible. You know what? Big props to Kevin Franks for getting out from behind the one. He dips down to the bottom side. That may be a race-winning move for our number 98. Kevin Franks may have done exactly what he needs to do. Here comes the 30, though. Brett Fisher, first time he's been in this situation. But look at this. Joshua Abbey runs out of fuel, has to pit with two laps to go. He's back in third place. Incredible. Man, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm watching Abbey who like you said, had the pit stop and had to come back up through. He got really lucky and that caution didn't get any damage. You look at the 30 car just in front of him. We saw that car upside down earlier on in this race. They come to the white flag. He's going to actually be the leader at the line and is going to have a great chance to run it to the end. We got four, now maybe five cars gunning for this race win into turn number one for the final time. Guys, Holden McGill. Coming up on the leaders right now. He's going to have a heck of a run coming down this back straightaway. If that opens for him, he's going to have a lot more speed. Looks like he's going to slot in behind him. So that run maybe he was hoping for is not there. But Joshua Abbey, as we said, you know, we thought he was out of this thing. Here we go. Coming to the last two set of corners. This is going to get interesting. Final time through turns three and four. Kevin Franks on point. What can they do behind him? Here comes Joshua Abbey. Does he have something for the 98? No. Hold him McGill says, nope, you're out of here. Kevin Franks wins at Daytona. How about Holden McGill gets back into second? Joshua Abbey, he claims a podium after everything that we just saw. I think I'm going to come up to more two lap to go situations and just run myself out of fuel because I'll be darned if that didn't work out better than I think it ever could have for Joshua Abbey, Kevin Franks, and oh my. I, th there's only so many words you can say sometimes and I think I've run out. I I'm not often speechless, but this end of this race has made me so. Yeah, you, we talked about those guys. They were just sitting ducks with seven, eight laps to go, having to come into pit while everyone else had already come through. And then just absolutely, I would call that nothing more than just a lucky break for these guys with that big crash that they got through cleanly. They were at the tail end of the field, so they had time to react more so than everybody else in front of them. Obviously, Kevin Frank's the one who came out on top in all of that. But like you said, McGill, Abby, the rest of them just got a really great chance to avoid that wreck and come back up to the front at the uh, conclusion of tonight's race. For Franks, he has enough fuel to burn it down. Well deserved. He's going to do that until the rubber falls off for that engine expires. And I don't blame him one bit. An absolute heck of a run. Hadn't heard much of him all race. Comes up with about 10 to go, as we mentioned. Was up front. Ended up having that pit workout in his favor. And here he is, winning Daytona. That is a heck of a storybook to write off Daytona. And that's a heck of a lot of a momentum to write in to start the season going into next week. I 
you know what? You said it pretty nicely there, Trey Patton. I'll just say we're going to go to our post-race break. We'll be right to, back to you momentarily. What an insane way to start out the season for the LTAC Cup Series. I'm not so sure that the 28 races coming up are going to be able to top this. What a day. What what an event, and, and what a way to ride off into the sunset for these guys. We'll be back to you here in just a few moments for continuing coverage of the Tucson Sound Art 250. Kevin Franks is your race winner. How about it? Sound art is a product that is a speaker and it's art. We combine it together and we call it sound art. What makes it so unique that any picture can be your speaker? Sound art gives you the high quality sound without the ugly speaker. This isn't a picture with the speaker, the picture is the speaker. Just imagine your wedding picture uh, uploaded onto a canvas and now it's speaking 10,000 tunes. I mean, it's a very cool concept. What we like so much about it that you can take anything that means something very special to you, upload it on the canvas, have it hanging up in your room, your balcony, wherever you want to put it, and now it's a speaker. I mean, how cool is that? It's, it's, it's something that we have that and no one has. No one has this product. It's just a great gift to give anybody. It's just a neat concept. Around here we say, art never sounded so good. After months of quarantine, we're all interested in how we can become our best self. The team at Permanent Makeup and Cryo is here to help you get the flawless makeup look every day without the extra effort or time. When it comes to your appearance, you deserve the best care that money can buy.
Welcome back to Daytona International Speedway. Uh, once again, leaving me speechless is not often that that happens. All we can say after that is wow. Uh, we're talking a little bit, you know, in our, in our break right there. And guys, I, I'm not sure that anyone could have expected what we've seen this evening. And I, I don't think there's any better way than to just talk to our uh, our, our drivers here now. Post race, our top three, our podium. And we'll lead right off with, of course, race winner Kevin Franks. Kevin Franks, do you have a copy? Yeah, I got you. Kevin, at one point, with about 10 to go, we're up here. We're, we're, we're saying, man, what would it be if Kevin Franks uh, is able to, to save fuel with the rest of these guys and win? Just what if these guys can do it? You end up having to make the pit stop. Of course, the caution doesn't come out. You're not able to save enough fuel. We kind of expected that. What we didn't expect is everything that happened after your pit stop, and especially after that caution flag uh, that put us into overtime. What did we just watch? I'm still trying to process it myself. Uh, I know when uh, that car should come out, I knew I had enough here to make it even for the uh, the three the attempts of the green white checker. Uh, so I just stayed out. Uh, the car in front of me said he had some damage. So I just crossed my fingers, hoping he wouldn't slow us down when the uh, green flag took off. Luckily, uh, everything worked out just right. Everything worked out just right and more. And talk about that restart. We just saw that replay. Uh, I I don't even know exactly where to go with that. I mean, you just barely, by the narrowest of margins, get underneath their hold. And suddenly, you've got a ton of help from behind in the form of the number 30 of Brett Fisher, who at one point was upside down in this race. How did it all work out in those last two laps? And I mean, it, if you go back 50 laps halfway, did you ever think this was what was going to happen? No, not at all. I was basically just kind of riding uh, through the uh, the pit stops. You know, since we had 50% fuel, we'd get about near 20 laps on the fuel run. And just hope things work out where I'd be towards front at the end and see what happened from there. And uh, I didn't quite expect the end of the race. I was hoping maybe get up towards the top 10 finish anyway. Uh, well, it's a whole lot more than just a top 10. I'm not sure if you got any stage points over the evening, but boy, you're getting max points at least from just race finish, and it's going to be a pretty good week going into Richmond, I'd say. How do you prep going from a place like Daytona suddenly to a three-quarter mile in Richmond Raceway next week? Uh, well, of course, they'll be using the, you know, the brakes a lot more going into the turns, and you know, be still be close side by side, but uh, you know, luckily, uh, if there's any wrecks, hopefully, won't be quite as many cars involved like this here at the Super Speed Race. Absolutely, there were definitely a lot of cars involved. Thankfully, you weren't involved in too many, it seems. Yeah, bring it home with a very clean car at the end of 108 laps. Congratulations to you, Kevin. Who do you have to thank? All right, I'd like to thank uh, AirTac for putting on the league. Uh, it's my uh, first season with them. Uh, thank you to uh, Pitch Stop TV for broadcasting it. I uh, did share the link on my Facebook page. Hopefully some of my family and friends got to watch it. Uh, just anybody else involved with this, uh, I'd just like to thank them. Also my sponsors on the car, Vaughn Incorporated. That's my employer. Uh, on the trunk lid, you see that it's for the uh, Desert Storm War Memorial Association. Uh, and anybody else and all the other drivers for a good race tonight. Well, thank you so much for your time here, Kevin. Best of luck to you there on Friday at Richmond Raceway. We'll see you there. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. That's Kevin Franks, the Tucson Sound Art 250 winner. Wow. I uh, again just completely speechless by everything. But you know what? Who can you know who can put it into words for us a little better? Possibly Trey Patton and Holden McGill. Trey, I'll turn it over to you. We're going to bring in our P2 finisher, Holden McGill. Man, you put on an absolute clinic tonight. You sweat both stages, and you end up almost winning. You just get edged out about 58 thousandths of a second. We saw you coming up there on the white flag. You had it winded up, or wound up, I guess. Um, 
I thought you were going to maybe shoot to the outside if there was a spot there, and I thought you may have been able to get that. Just talk us through that, man. Just talk us through the entire night and just how it feels to just, you know, come up just slightly short. Well, hate to leave <laughs> hate to leave one box unchecked, but still feel pretty good about having a great race, being there at the end, having a shot at it, and just... The whole last restart, it felt like cars kept falling out and I just had to keep going where they weren't and it just kept working and somehow had the huge run come into the line and had to find somewhere to go with it. Well, that being said, that run, you know, you split them three wide and almost ended up, you know, looked like a little bit of contact coming to the line, but, you know, nonetheless, you ended up finishing second. You know, you started on the pole finishing second so you still get a podium you got ma almost max points total today you know you got two stage points so you got that going for you going into the season and just going into the playoffs in general so what momentum can you carry from tonight going to a track like richmond next week well, i feel like i can take a good bit and feel pretty good i guess i'm probably leading the points at this point so if i do have a bad race it doesn't doesn't really kill me, but I don't really have a whole lot of experience at Richmond, so I'm going to have to do some work on that this week, but hopefully can show up Friday and continue the good run that I've started this weekend. Well, luckily for you, those stage points and stage victories and a P2 finish has got you up further in the points, so you know, you got a long season ahead of you, so definitely get, those, uh, get that experience on those tracks you may not be so experienced at and just stay consistent and then Hopefully you'll be in the run for the championship. Uh, you know, before I let you go, anybody you want to thank? Anybody you want? Anybody you want to say hi to before we let you go? I uh, just want to thank my teammates Grant Peterson and Anthony Musadi in the 49. He, both of them, did a lot to help keep me up near the front, and I wish it would have worked out a little better for them. Uh, want to say hi to my buddies Ryan and Kevin. I know they were watching tonight, so that's pretty cool. And yeah, just. Thanks to our whole Badger Racing team that we've kind of built together, help each other get better, and then work together on track. So just want to thank all of them. Man, that's all we got for you. Hope to be talking to you soon, maybe later this week or maybe later on this season. And we're going to turn it over to Joe for our P3 finisher, Joshua Abbey. Yes, yeah, so a name that you might recognize from the Bluegrass iRacing Series here on the channel. Joshua Abbey, this is Joe Donahue. You got me in the booth here? Yes, sir. How y'all doing? Well, Josh, we're doing pretty good, and I'm sure you're doing pretty swell as well. You finished P3 tonight. You had a great run on that final drive to the finish and you just barely got caught out at the end and beaten to the line for second place but just from your perspective what was that last lap uh it was kind of chaotic uh wasn't really sure what line to go uh 24 and 30 i believe ran out of gas uh coming towards back stretch i mean i think it was going into three so it was kind of trying to figure out what line to run and, and once the 30 ran out of gas, try to get a good side draft off of him and hope I got enough to get a, a 98. And I seen the 21 with a full head steam and as uh, I wanted to move down just a tab, but I knew I was going to take us both out. So I just kind of let it happen and I uh, wish I told him, I said, man, I wish you would have pushed me. We would have got one, two maybe, but uh, I'll take a P3. I mean, it's plate racing. So let's take all the points you can get at the end of the day and try to survive a race like this. Absolutely. And now I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take you back to stage two. Your whole race kind of snowballed off of a decision you made to stay out at that <laughs> point in the race. And I wanted to get your insight on that one because it did end it did end up getting you the position on track to get to the line where you did. But when you were sitting there at the end of stage two, what was the thought process and what was the strategy move? Uh, I kind of wanted to stay out just to uh, kind of hopefully split the last stage in half. And it didn't work out that way. We, we got, I think we got two quick cautions. So I went ahead and, and pitted. And uh, you know, it, it's 
one of those deals where you think you might be able to save enough and you can't. And I, I knew I was about three laps shy and I uh, kind of had to either commit or see what you can run out. Well, the guy that I was running with, he went ahead and pitted. So I was all low man, you know, on an island by myself. So luckily uh, I pitted and uh, we had that caution come out right while I was in the in the pits. And uh, then we had that melee on that second to last or last uh, caution. And when they all just started you know, bowling into each other. I went down low and I made up all the spots I needed. So it kind of put me in a good position at the end. Um, but, it, you know, I'll, I'll say it was lucky. By no means did I plan it that way. Um, but try to stretch out what you can. And uh, like I said, it, it kind of was going to bite me in the end. Uh, luckily, I uh, had the cards played right and I uh, was able to get a, a good finish at the end. Yeah, I was certainly going to mention that at one point, I mean, you came into the pits with just a few laps to go, and surely you, you must have felt pretty gutted about that. But you got a lucky oh, yeah. break with that yellow that came back out. And then obviously that uh, crazy incident that took out many of the cars in your way. I mean, when you came into the pits, surely you did feel that gutted feeling that, oh, my race is going to be over. And But what was the reaction when you got that yellow? And then on top of that, what was your reaction when you saw the whole wreck pass you in your mirror rather than in front of you? And you realized I have a shot to win this race. Uh, the iRacing guys were pointing down on me saying, hey, we're going to give you one last chance. <laughs> um, I, that's honestly what it felt like because like i said i felt gutted i was like man there goes my race then we got the caution uh, i mean i i used my fast repair on i think the second caution so i was like lap 13 14 uh so it's kind of survival um and when all those guys started wrecking i just checked up just shot it down low towards the inside wall near pits and then shot back up and i look over, i think it was like 19th the next time i look over i'm uh fifth and so it's like, all right well it's go time so I'll just send it and see what we can do Awesome stuff, Josh. Well, congratulations on all of that. Obviously, you put a good show together tonight. Before we let you go, we we're going to give you the stage, let you thank anybody or make note of anyone out there before we go and send you off from the broadcast. Anything you want to say here? Oh, yeah. Uh, I appreciate you guys broadcasting. You know, like I said, we do bluegrass uh, with y'all and y'all do uh, great content, good quality content. I'm, I'm happy I get to talk to y'all. You know, uh, we're going to be in Richmond next week, and uh, I feel like I've gotten a lot better at Richmond. Uh, we, when we were there about two weeks ago, I think Bluegrass led some laps and showed some speed there. Uh, I got primetime sports stock on the car, uh, great website, fancy sports, uh, uh, and all, sort, all, all sports alike uh, that we do, so y'all go ahead and check them out. Uh, DTJ, my, my uh, dirt track junkies, my teammates, uh, can't do it without them. A lot of practice that we put in forth. You know, Wes, unfortunately, had a rough night. He got taken out, I think, a couple times. Um, you know, even Quest Tech Precision, it's a great sponsor, 41 Shocks with Earl Baxter. Uh, if you need real shocks for your real race car, uh, he's the guy to go to. Uh, Charlie Milner, Milner Media Design, puts great wraps on my car. I, I love this primetime wrap. It's a flip-flop scheme. It's beautiful. Shows really good in the nighttime. Uh, Sky, uh, got to thank the wife. At the end of the day, you know, happy wife, happy life. She lets me do this, and I appreciate it and love her to death for letting me do it. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. Awesome stuff, Josh. Well, congratulations. We'll let you go. Have a good night. Happy wife, happy life. I like that you brought that in with us. It's always important to make note of those people who keep us on our toes and, and keep us honest throughout the day and, you know, make it all worthwhile. So thank you. Have a good night. And Andrew, that's the uh, conclusion of a really great interview with the top three there. A lot of really awesome stuff coming out of the last couple laps of this one. That's certainly one way to wrap up what has been a wild day. Uh, there, again, there's only so many ways we can try and put it, so we'll just go ahead and we'll get straight into our race results. All unofficial, there's a few things that obviously admins will tank review too, obviously with that yellow line rule as well. Uh, they will check into things and make sure all of this is official for us by next week, by Friday, with our point standings. But for now, Kevin Franks wins, and I don't think that's going to change. What a, what a turnaround for him. Kevin Franks winning at Daytona by just 0 0.059 of a second that is just under sixth one hundredths of a second or a little over a half a tenth holden mcgill finishes second place joshua abbey we talked to him as well third derek roleveld didn't say that name a single time aside from the grid he finishes fourth mitchell goosen's fifth brett fisher who was upside down at one point sixth spot Landon Durhold, we said his name a whole lot last season, very rarely this evening, seventh place. Frank Flores, he might not have won, 
But I'll be darned, my pick still got up into the top 10. I looked down, I think he was 17th when I picked him. Frank Flores pops up into 8th place. Taylor Butcher Benjamin up there in 9th. Uh, honestly, quite a recovery for him as well. And Lauren, Lauren McFadden. We didn't talk about Lauren at all this afternoon, this evening, but he still finishes in the top 10. A pretty good way to open up the season. Absolutely, and just looking outside of that top 10, you've got Zach Arnold in the 10, following Stephen Parrott, Ryan Duke, Robert Mathis, John Fallon, all of those drivers in the top 15, which you might be thinking, oh, you know, that's not a top 10 or a top 5, but that is a really good, solid way to start off your race season. Mason Thompson comes home in 16th. 17th will be Mario Lapinta. You've got Nate Brooker, that number 3 car, comes home 18th. Roy Grande in 19th place. That's two laps down. Brooker was the first car to finish on the lap down chart and then Curtis Martin in the 04 rounds out your top 20. 21st we got Logan Hamilton after acquiring a speeding penalty and then having his engine expire after being up front most of the race heartbreak for him finishes 21st Robert Pattengill we saw him have a little bit of trouble earlier on today caught up in another incident or two ends up finishing 22nd Colin Stone, 23rd. Jack Ryan, we saw him up front a little bit, ends up finishing 24th. Jeremy Berger, another guy we've seen up front most of the day, ends up 25th. Joseph Joseph, another front runner, finishes in 26th. Ryder Shrouf, 27th. Stephen Purse uh, Purcell, excuse me, finishes 28th. Andrew Cootie, after a few incidents, finishes 29th. And Derek Lyon rounds out the top 30. Checking in at 31st, Anthony Masati, who we thought had a shot to win it all. Coming to the white flag, gets turned around, and that was on a green-white checkered. Gets turned around in front of the entire field, and well, the rest is history for Anthony Masati and his number 49 effort, finishing 31st position. Sean Deal right there with him, both six laps down. Kyle Green, eight laps down, gets taken out at the end as well. Richard Springer, 34th. Dylan Breton, 35th. Roger Shelton, 36th. Wes Wigand, oh my, what a race it was for him. Gets taken out on the back stretch, finishes 37th position. Bradley Walters, after that incredible incident there with the 95, finishes up 38th position. Chris Horn, 39th. Grant Peterson, what a start it looked like for him. Racing up there early with his teammate. Had a shot, we thought. To be able to work on that stage with his teammate Holden McGill ended up getting spun around in front of the field, much like Anthony Masati. Apparently, one of his teammates who finishes on the other end of the screen in 31st, Grant Peterson finishes 40th, 74 laps down to the race winner. The last two cars in the field Sean Huff Stutler in 41st and James Vining in 42nd. Guys, we'll just do one quick round of the table here. Uh, you know, again, just absolutely speechless. It, it's so hard to take what we just saw. A, a driver starting 37th position, almost maybe had it on a fuel strategy, then was out of it. Then after two massive incidents, is suddenly back into it. And now we get this picture of him burning down at Daytona. What a way to wrap things up. Yeah, I think LTAC really spoke for itself maybe if we're unable to speak on its behalf this race finish and, and how exciting it was throughout the entire night we had good racing all the way through we had a couple incidents that caught the attention of some action obviously for your winner kevin franks like you said working his way up from the tail having to fight the field to get to that spot and then getting a little bit of a lucky break with that major incident that just put him in great position to take advantage of where he was starting on that final restart and obviously major congratulations a tip of the hat to everybody who got to the finish and and even competed in tonight's race i think overall even if we who we are here to try to speak on behalf of the racing but even if we are so starstruck as to not say i think the racing spoke for itself tonight absolutely the racing yeah i mean we had some yellows but you're at daytona it's a season opener it's going to be a bang it's going to be a wreck fest it was exciting nonetheless and to see an upset victory like frank's winning right there you know as he said this is his first run with ltec so i mean a rookie to come into Daytona and, you know, start almost last and to come up and win like that, that's something to say. You know, he's here, stamped his name in the history books. He's a winner. 
And we don't even know what to expect from him in the weeks coming. Uh, absolutely. We have no clue what's going to happen at Richmond. Uh, we, I, I think we have even less of a clue now to expect uh, at Richmond uh, as we did for Daytona earlier today. Uh, I think there are so many more unknowns now that we've gone through this 250 miler than, than ever before. I can't wait to unload Friday and be able to bring everybody yet another amazing event on the horizon. Still, just absolutely incredible. I, it, it's so hard to try and wrap this one up, but let's just remind everybody about our wonderful partners here at Pit Stop TV, I suppose. With Flash Media, of course, they do a lot for us. All these graphics, camera packs especially, they make it happen over at Whiplash Media. You can contact them as well, whiplash-media.com or Whiplash Media on Facebook to get them to take care of you. Our social media posts, again, courtesy of Whiplash Media. Real racing photography, social media management, they can hit you up as well. Uh, we also want to, of course, I talked about permanent makeup and mayo, um, permanent makeup and cryo in Maine rather a while ago. Uh, a big thank you to them and Ashley Boyer uh, up in Maine and the rest of her team always supporting Pit Stop TV and uh, just being quality partners as well. Uh, and last but not least, Tucson Sound Art, the presenting sponsor of the evening. What Robert Patton Gale and company do for us is incredible. They, they take great care of us. We try to take great care of them. And uh, certainly, I, I think, quality partners over at Tucson Sound Art. And if you're still in the dark, possibly, much like Lake Lloyd about what uh, Tucson Sound Art is, well, your picture, your music, you provide the image you want and they will custom create a beautiful framed high quality canvas with a built in Bluetooth speaker. With Sound Art, you get the best of both worlds. Visit TucsonSoundArt.com for additional info and to order using code PITSTOPTV at checkout for 10% off of your Tucson Sound Art device today. Basically, it's uh, as it says. It is a device with a Bluetooth speaker with a canvas wrapped around it to the size that you specify. Uh, I mean, what else is there to say? You can take any moment from your life, put it up on a canvas up on your wall. It looks fantastic. We've got one myself. Uh, absolutely one of the coolest things I've got in my house. A really, really cool device. Many, many thanks to Robert Patton, Gale and Company over there at, uh, at Tucson Sound Art. Uh, quality partners for sure. And uh, with that, though, I, I, I think that's what we've got. I, I think that does conclude our coverage tonight of the Tucson Sound Art 250. We at Pit Stop TV, thank you for tuning in and joining us for tonight's action, and we hope you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. Be sure to tune in tomorrow evening for the BRP Racing Series Big Block Season Opener at Volusia and the Pacific GT3 Challenge at Road America. Continuing our virtual stay in Elkhart Lake, the Bluegrass Eye Racing Series takes to Elkhart's Pride and Joy Wednesday evening before the LTAC Cup Series rejoins the lineup Friday from Richmond. Make sure to follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash pitstoptv, on Twitter at pitstoptv underscore, on Twitch at www.twitch.tv forward slash pit underscore stop underscore tv, and on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash c forward slash pitstop tv1 for all of pitstop tv joe donahue and trey Patton with me on the mic Corey rexford over on social media i'm andrew cardinale the fourth thank you and we will see you next time <laughs>